Join me in a pledge, please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilmember Rogers? Here. Allett? Here. Bowers? Baker? Here. Brown? Here. Yerke? Here. Mayor Jim Dixon? Here. City Administrator Darrell McDonald? Present. City Attorney Carl Hanlon? Here. City Clerk Betty Schwitzer? Here. Deputy City Clerk Christian Samora? Here. City Treasurer Cheryl Brown Kovacic. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just want to yes. make you aware that the uh, cable feed is not being consistent uh, leaving the building. The recording will be complete uh, for the recording and what goes on YouTube into the library, but right now, if someone's watching at home, it seems to be going in and out. Okay. It's been doing that for quite a while, by the way. Does it? So was last night's recorded too, or did it? Yeah, was it yeah the recordings don't seem to be affected. Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll have the citizen participation, three minute time limit. Uh, items that are not on the agenda or uh, up for uh, public. Uh. Okay, we'll start. I'm Billy Carlisle and I live at 208. Uh, Mesa Court. I want to apologize tonight for leaving early. I try to follow everything that you all are doing uh, closely, and I feel like a slacker if for some reason I need to leave early. But I promise you I'm working hard tonight. It just happens to be on my paying job. I wanted to thank Hal Brown for his uh, public uh, meeting that he held with his constituents on, uh, I think it was this past uh, Friday night. It was a delightful event. We exercised our right to gather, assemble as people can in a free society. And we got to interact with our elected official. He happens to be in my ward, but I hope to have opportunities like that with all of you over time. And what I found was that it was a relaxed setting and a lot less stressful than the typical meeting here and, and, and it was just a delight. We heard from the police department, some of them were there, I, I'm sure in their role as just citizens, but to participate and join in and some members of uh, the administration. And I want to take time to thank Eileen Rogers for some of her past meetings of a similar sort, like being at uh, the coffee shop and having a group and advertising that and mm. interacting with us. Uh, one of the most touching conversations I had with Eileen ever, and one that influenced me, I think, for the rest of my life, was a five-minute exchange we had after everyone else had wandered off from one of those meetings. I, I appreciated that. And uh, I think that so many times here, our time to speak is short, and the process is so orchestrated that it's stressful for everyone. You can come to the podium and you don't know if it's on the agenda or if it's not or at what point you're gonna to get to speak. And I've just gotten into the habit of coming here and say, what can I speak on and what can I not tonight? You know, But I know that before I got wise enough to do that, that there were times when I would come here and the meeting would be over and I realized if I was going to get to speak to that, I should have done it at the beginning and Later in the meeting, it didn't come up, and it's, uh, it's something that if you want to participate here, you really have to be diligent at it and be here meeting after meeting uh, to learn that process. And I, I want to say about the process here that sometimes it's driven toward an orchestrated end, and it doesn't seem that it's oriented toward getting that public input. It's more toward getting the result that you want. So what I'm hoping is that we will all think of a way to lighten up and go forward uh, with some less formal conversations with each other 
in some less formal environments. And thanks for this opportunity. Y'all have a good evening tonight. And again, I apologize for leaving early, but I, it can't be helped. Thank you, Billy. Has he? Nancy Dominic, JT County. I want to thank Hal for the meeting Friday night and also Ms. McDonald for so graciously helping the public to understand some of the answers. Um, I believe it's really important for the public to have a hand in what's going on because <coughs> our tax dollars are being spent running this city. I, didn't, I did attend Ms. Rogers' um, meetings when she used to have them at C Cafe Dawn, but she quit having them when I showed up, I guess, because I was there, she stopped. Anyway, <laughs> um, she, uh, she said that nobody attended, but there was quite a few of us that did attend when we found out when it was. But one thing that I found out that I was very upset to find out that our police department, the police department that pe protects us all day and all night, have such a poor pay scale, especially when I find out that our new deputy city clerk makes nearly 15,000 more than our police officers. These people are here to protect the, our lives. They put their lives on the line every day and every night. And I think that we should truly, really try to, to get them a little bit better pay. It, instead of sitting at a cushy office job, you know, they're out protecting us. And they're even protecting you people that are sitting at your cushy office jobs. So our, protect, our fire department and our police department are our most important entities in this city, and we should take care of them. And if it means giving them a raise, give them the raise. You guys have got enough money. These people are working day and night, and they need our support. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. Will we next, Vern? Yeah, Vernon Davis, Slida. <coughs> I, too, would like to thank Al Brown for the town hall meeting Friday at the community center. Heard nothing but positive about it, and I don't just mean Nancy and Billy. <laughs> uh, because of all the negative comments you received at the work session last night, sir, I would like to rent the meeting room the next time and invite you as my guest speaker. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a comment to Mr. Baker, if that's okay. Keep it civil. I do. Okay. Are you saying I don't? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Keith, during the discussion this AM concerning a complaint filed against a board member, <clears throat> could you possibly change your public input till after the board speaks and not before? And the reason I ask is because many false statements were made and you would not allow us to correct the false statements and I know that the facts that I have are accurate <coughs> because I have transcripts of actual meetings I wanted to state. So, thank you. That's up to the board. Okay. Well, up you're to the, the chairperson. Board. We can bring it up. Okay. We can bring it Please up. Do. But when you say I didn't allow him to speak, what I did was stop conversation while the board was in discussion. And then after that, I looked out. Cindy Green still wanted to speak. No one else raised their hand, although they had earlier. At that point, they did not raise their hand to come back up. Yes, he did. Steve so Tafoya was on. Steve Tafoya was raising his hand. I turned around, and saw him. He did not raise his hand when I went okay. back to the public. Thanks, Vern. Who'll be next, Monica? Monica Griesenbeck, Salida. Good evening. <coughs> During the budget town meeting last Friday, Administrator McDonald said that the $150,000 budgeted for the new water dump station on the Vanderveer Ranch was not being transferred from the general fund. This was kind of alarming news to me. <laughs> I would like some clarification on that statement. Since the 2014 budget, as adopted, clearly states on page 11 and 12 that, quote, 
Money transferred from the general fund will pay for a potable water station, sewer dump, and Grover cleaning facility to serve area residents, rafters, campers, and visitors with recreational vehicles. We know that the Grover station cleaner is no longer being funded, but how is the water dump station being paid for if not from the general fund? I really would like an answer to that. Number two, during last night's budget work session, we learned that the finance director, Jan Schmidt, is recommending a 4 to 5 percent annual rate increase for the wastewater and a 3 percent increase for water. Is that a total of 7 or 8 percent annually? I would like an answer for that, too, please. We also learned that the water fund is operating at a $580,000 deficit and the sewer fund at a $502,000 deficit. If these deficits were foreseen by the finance department last year when the 2014 budget was proposed, why was the $150,000 for the new water dump station initially debited to the water and sewer enterprise? I just don't get that at all. It wasn't until people complained that you backtracked on that and you decided at your meeting to take that out of the water and sewer enterprise and transfer it to the, the general fund, as I recall. Number three, during last night's budget work session, Council Member Yerke Rogers and Baker severely chastised Council Member Brown for conducting a town meeting on the budget at the Senior Center last Friday. I find it very curious that this governing body, rather than chastising Mr. Brown, isn't congratulating him for reaching out to the citizens to find out what their desires and concerns are. The informal setting of a town meeting allows citizens to communicate freely with their council representatives. I want to thank Hal Brown for providing that opportunity to us, and I urge you all to join him rather than criticizing his effort. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Monica. <coughs> Who'll be next? Jan? Jan Sebastian Salida. Well, it kind of looks like this Hal Brown's fan club is here today, and uh, I think he certainly deserves it. Uh, I'd like to thank the the uh, council people who did feel it was important enough to attend, and uh, I think we got a few things done. I hope there's another another one soon because certainly there's more things that need to be discussed. Um, I. I think that the uh, police and fire department, uh, their representation there, they went home and went to the trouble of putting on uniforms to come back to the, uh, to the meeting. Uh, and I think they are not well represented. It seems that the emphasis of um, salaries the, uh, seems to be on the, uh, on the uh, administration. And it's true that we hire people into, into administration with no qualifications whatsoever. On the other hand, uh, policemen and firemen have to go through very extensive uh, training and certification and so on, and continuing uh, certification uh, for a number of years, and they're not paid very well for it. The, um, the administration people, some of them are completely unqualified and overpaid, I think. And we're spending too much money in that area. We need to be spending on the people to do the work, uh, including the uh, public works. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Anyone else? No one? Okay, we'll end the Citizen participation. Next item, we have uh, no presentations, I guess. Okay. Under new business, uh, 
each of the council, you have a letter here in front of you from Miss Dominic. And she would uh, like to read that at a council meeting in the, the next council meeting. So you want to put it on the agenda? Need direction for the, for the agenda. So moved. Okay. Second. Got it. Second. Any discussion? Sorry, second. Oh, I'm sorry. Discussion? Okay. Could I ask for clarification? What do you what do you want to see on the agenda? The letter from Miss Dominic. So you just want that included in the packet or do you want a line item on the agenda for something? It would be in the packet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just included in well, I think you need a line item on the agenda. Line to item, it. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> For discussion. Okay. Did we vote on that? Yeah. We need a vote. Got yeah. a motion and a second. Didn't get a vote. Got a motion and a second. Discussion. <clears throat> okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Okay. Next item. On the consent agenda. Uh, Councilman Bowers called me today and he can't make it. He couldn't make it tonight. He wishes to be present for the MOU, which is the uh, Department of Transportation Memorandum of Understanding. And uh, so I need direction from the council if we want to move that to the next uh, council meeting. Um, I think what you might want to consider is to go ahead and allow discussion um, tonight because it was on the agenda um, okay. in case there are people here who came for that item and then continue any decision making until Councilman Bowers can be present. Until next time. Okay. That's yeah, fine. I, I think that's fine, fine too. Uh, but on, while we're on the consent agenda, Mr. Mayor, there are two items under listed under consent agenda. Mm -hmm. that I feel need to be pulled out and discussed separately. The uh, Chisholm Park Playground Bid Award and the fee waiver request for 350 Central Colorado. Would like to have some discussion on those before they are approved. Okay. So you'd like to pull that off? So, I, so it is that we do that with a motion? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I, I move that the Chisholm Park Playground bid award item and the fee waiver request for 350 Central Colorado be removed from the consent agenda and the remainder of the consent agenda be combined and approved as written. Second. Okay. Motion like, and a second. I'd like those moved to item seven and eight. Item seven and eight or item two and three, I guess it doesn't matter. What, I know there are a couple members of the public here to specifically for the fee waiver request or, or so. Let's then let's do those toward the front next. Of the agenda then. Do those as 1A and 1B? Yeah, I think that works. Is that a motion, Al? Yes. Second? We have a motion and a second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We motion carried. I move we uh, combine the remainder of the consent agenda. I think he already did that. He did that. We did. He did, yeah. Just now. Your oh, you did It was. It was a multi-part yeah. motion. Yeah. Oh, he did the whole thing all at once. Oh, what? <laughs> Go. Sure all right. Okay. Okay, next Chisholm. item. The vote. Chisholm Park. Will be amendment of emergency telephone no, charge. No, no. Hmm? We got to do Park. Chisholm Park. Oh, we got to do that first. Okay. All right. Oh, Kevin Crowley, come on up. I'm Kevin Crowley. I work for the city. I'm the buildings and grounds maintenance supervisor. Go ahead. So the Chisholm Park Playground project is one that was budgeted for this year. Uh, we've kind of made a commitment to try to rehaul, overhaul all of our uh, city parks. Many of the parks like Chisholm Park, um, we kind of get dinged a little bit from Cersei every year because some of the equipment's not compliant. Um, it's also not an ADA compliant playground. 
so we kind of are exposed a little bit there to some liability. <coughs> so we went out to bid and we collected bids with the thought for that park of kind of being a very natural playscape. We wanted kind of some rock and timber feels, some earth colors, something that would fit into that neighborhood without being, well, I mean, obnoxious, I guess. So uh, we had a spec sheet. We went out to bid. We collected uh, a total of seven bids. Most all of them in the, in the same realm, in the 40 to 50. Basically a turnkey project. The only thing we're on the hook for is removing the existing equipment out, getting it removed. Um, it'll be ADA compliant. Uh, all, of the, all of the bids are ADA compliant. Um, if you look all the way down to the low bid, and I know there are fairly small pictures on the back, but there's a picture of the top bid, which 50,000 was our budget for the, for the park. And the uh, lower bid here on the right-hand side is uh, 24350 I guess. I mean, I think it's fairly easy to see the difference in what you're getting for your money between the two playgrounds. Um, you've got a lot of features in the left-hand playground, a lot more activity, a lot more ground-based activities, too, for the handicapped where there's, where there's opportunities for them at ground level to participate in some events. The one on the right hand, although it's ADA compliant, it's only compliant because it has one feature that's a ground feature. Um, and as you can see from the playground, there's a lot more of the space that we currently have at that park that's just open land. I mean, there's just not equipment in it. Um, so there again, as we met and looked over the other bids, I, there was nobody without the opinion that the, the one here from the Churchill or Churchitch Recreation was by far the better playground for the dollars, we felt. Um, and it just seems like there again with the city mantra of doing it once and doing it right, it seems wrong to put the low bid playground in when we're really comparing apples and oranges. We're not saying it's the same playground and somebody's $24,000 cheaper or whatever. They're vastly different playgrounds. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So anyway, I guess that's where we came upon the recommendation for the church's bid. Um, they removed shipping on it. They removed a lot of their installation fees because they knew we were working within the budget. So actually, in theory, we're beyond the 50000 that they've come in on their bid with just because they wanted the project. Um, so were I don't the, know. Were the specifications presented the same to everyone? Yes, sir. There was a packet that was put out that, that dictated the the features that we wanted and that they had to be ADA compliant and it had to meet with SIRSA guidelines for, you know, there's fall zones and there's distances from swings that you can't have other equipment and those sorts of, uh, those sorts of insurance regulations. So all of the items did comply with those two facts. Um, it was just there again, the one was, was a much bigger playground and a much more active playground we felt like than the other one was. Did, did all of the uh, bidders, were all of the bidders aware of what the budget was? Yes, sir. That's a, that's, well, you almost have to release that number or you could get playground bids in for, you know, $180,000 or whatever. Um, and there again, I guess I've always believed since it's public information, they probably could do their homework and find out what the city budgeted for a playground in a particular year anyway. So it's, it's not top secret. Yeah. Um, in, private, in the private industry, that'd be hard to say, though, what's to tell someone what your budget is in advance. I understand that, but that's kind of the way it works. Yeah. The one thing that I'm kind of disappointed with is I live across the street from that, so I get to see who's using the park, and I really would have liked to have seen an older age group that would have been benefited by it, not just for the real young ones, because... And I can't tell by those pictures because they're not real clear. Sure. But uh, the, and particularly since they redid the park, they really the kids really do hang out and utilize the tables and the pavilion and whatever. But the older kids really like those swings and having something there that occupies their time to play on. I really feel like this doesn't really show that the one piece of equipment there on the right 
looks like that might be kind of I've, I've seen a piece something like that in Gunnison and that might be kind of fun well and that's and that is te technically as part of the specs we did demand that they had a, a swing set a, it had to have a slide it had to have a swing and there again it had to have like rock features or timber look that sort of thing so you know at first we were all a little taken back by this swing which is really kind of maybe three to four feet in diameter versus a traditional swing but as we thought about it, you know, it's kind of a different thing. And we could see kids hanging out on it and sitting on it and, and utilizing. Now that feature there again, for the same cost, can be switched out and the landing zone remains the same for a more traditional swing set. Uh, I, I, they have a slide there and it's almost never used. I mean. Well, it's, it, and that's a non-compliant slide too, so we're almost happy it's not being used much. But, but I understand slides, Slides versus swings, I think you have a swing no matter what, but uh, we So is that a swing or is that a thing that you spin on? No ma'am, it's a swing. It's, it's, oh, okay. it's actually on chains and the whole, the, whole, uh, okay. the whole deal swings as well. So it's not a one person swing, it's actually two or three possibly, I guess. So does that mean the other swing that they, the, the bench swing is going to be moved or, um, or stay? Yes ma'am, it'll come out. Okay, because Teresa had said it wasn't going to come the bench, out. The, the bench is on the side oh, of the no, park? No, I misunderstood. The one that's okay. in the playground, the, the, the sitting bench on the side is staying. Okay, yeah, all yeah, right. Absolutely. Well, I, 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 just those, those short slides, I, I don't know, I just would have liked to have seen a little bit more. I, and it has to be pretty indestructible because they are hard. I understand. <laughs> well, and we're limited over there, too. We have a certain, uh, we have a certain perimeter that's already kind of, the footprint's already there for a playground. So you're a little bit limited as far as the heights of swings because for every foot you go up, you go two feet further out on your fall zone. So you really are limited with higher swings, higher slides, that sort of thing, kind of change everything. And I thought that was a spinning thing because a thing that I'd seen you sit on and it, it kind of threw us all for a loop at okay. first. It was a little bit different. We kind of had to, to, to ask some questions of the vendor on it and, and really decide that, yeah, the whole thing does swing. And there again, they, they readily said, well, it can be switched out for a traditional swing at the same cost. They just thought it was kind of different. And so I guess they were trying to catch some attention. What are you it. suggesting? Well, I, I don't have a problem with that swing. The one that I just wonder about is the redundancy of, is that more than, is that multiple slides? What is, I can't even see in that. Well, this, this, this here is actually a log climbing thing. It has some branches that come out on the sides of it, and it actually is a you scale up it climbing feature. Uh, this one, am I doing that? Oh, oh there, that helps a lot. There is there is a shorter <laughs> slide here because we wanted to have a playground that was. There is two different ranges insurance has for playgrounds, and it's two to five, and it's five to thirteen. Mm -hmm. So we did want to have a slide for either for either age. So this one's a shorter one, and it's the two to five. And then you can see the shadow on this reverse side over here. There's a much longer that comes down and swirls, I think up here, swirls around that on it. And it's the slide then for the, I guess. In the older ones? The older kids, yeah. Um, and we had also in this one too, it was kind of neat. There was two fort features and kind of a rock wall thing that you climb up to get from the lower feature to the top feature, which is, I, you try to think of what kids would like sometimes and it's a little tough, but that seemed like kind of a neat feature to connect the two towers like that. And what's that thing up above the log thing that those, looks like there's several things That's jutting out? On the right, no? It's a tree. A little a tree. further, right, right above the log, right there. Those are just, I believe, trees that they've okay. put in the picture kind of architecturally. Although this Photoshop. one actually here obviously was mm -hmm. at the site Photoshop. because although I described <laughs> the wall, they didn't know how it stepped up, so they actually were one that did site visit, which not all of them did. They were going to Photoshop a tree. They should have Photoshopped some happy kids playing in well, there. Well, <laughs> actually there was one of the bids that had a really awful stick figure in the front that was a kid. <laughs> it, was, um, yeah, it was pretty sad. <laughs> Kevin, I, uh, thanks very much for your presentation and, and your explanation. I, the reason I asked for this particular item to be pulled out of the consent agenda was because when I just looked at the paper, there was immediately three red flags went up. 
Yes. You know, sir. number one, you got a whole bunch of, of bids grouped close together and one outlier that's way out. Way, way low. Yes, sir. And, uh, and then the other one is uh, the, uh, there's one number there that is very obviously a bid to budget. Yes, sir. Uh, so um, now well, I, I can only trust their, their speak that, hey, actually, we were over that, but we knew what your budget was, so we shaped, you know, how that could go. Yeah. So. And, and I assume that there is, a, we are, we're considered that we're fully, uh, we don't have any constraint. Like, see, the, the, my former life in bids, if you chose other than the lower bidder, you had to have very specific and, and justification, and there was a pretty long list of criteria. We're just, in our judgment, if it's the best bid, then we award and we don't need anything right. else. I mean, really, you're finding that it's in the best interest of the city yeah. to, to award that particular bid. And I think Kevin's given a really good explanation of the basis for that decision making process yeah. for council. Did the other bidders have the opportunity to sh do some of the adjustments that, that this one you claim is willing to do? Well, as far as swapping the swing out or not swapping uh, the swing out? Did, am I misunderstanding? But would dropping, you dropping their prices. Yeah. You're Sorry? Dropping the prices. What you're well, all of them knew what the budget was, so they could put components together and come up with any number they wanted to and cut it back to the 50. So there, was, I mean, there, there, there hasn't been any negotiation since the bid was received. If, if that's oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, after the bids were open, there's been no, there's been no okay. discussion. Or, or this was all in the, in the up to the bid opening stage. But... But yeah, they all could have put together packets that exceeded 50, you know, or theoretically exceeded 50, and then told us they were cutting it back to 50. They all had that opportunity, yeah. It wasn't anything after the bid opening. Because it kind of would have been nice to even see some of the others, but you know, well, it's not our job. I mean, I could bring others back. I just, to me, it became, a, of all the opinion of everyone that looked at it, it was between the one we really wanted, the high bid, versus, okay, here's this low ball one, and we felt like by offering those extremes, we kind of covered what we were all after. Um, um, so I trust, I trust your judgment. Yeah, no. it really was unanimous when it came down to who won the bid, honestly. There was, everyone that looked at it was, was unanimously in favor of the, of the church each one. Well, you need a resolution? Or? I think, what do we... Uh, do we need a motion? Uh, you do, since you pulled it off the consent agenda, if you just make a motion to approve the bid. Then I will uh, move, Mr. Mayor, that we uh, approve the awarding of the contract to uh, Church It's Recreation LLC in the amount of $50,000 for the uh, Chisholm Park playground <coughs> equipment. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? <laughs> okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. This motion. Thanks, Thank you, Kevin. Everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. Are we up for one B now? Mm -hmm. Who's here from the fee? Fee waiver request. Yeah. So I would just go ahead and turn this over to the gentlemen who are here tonight okay. recommending 350 um, Central Colorado. If the council would like to hear about why they are making the funding request. I like that big tall guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do too. Good evening. I'm Mel Strawn. I'm the co chair with Fred Rasmussen of 350 Central Colorado. Oh. And um, I believe you have our prospectus for this, our proposed forum. So I'm open for whatever concerns or questions you may have. I had uh, this again as I looked through the package, and I, I um, uh, it's labeled in the consent agenda as a fee waiver request. And then, as I read through it, it is uh, uh, I couldn't find a request for fee waiver, but rather it's a okay. just a request for a grant. Yeah, Mel and, pointed that out to me at the beginning yeah. of the meeting as and, well. Uh, would would that not be more appropriate to consider with our other community? Uh, service. Our understanding was this met the parameters of what council had most recently discussed in terms of funding requests for the balance of 2014. Okay, so uh, we're asking for 2014. Because their event is this year, so this is what, a current one. 
that it was a nonprofit and at the dollar amount that you were willing to go up to. Yeah. So I guess I have a, a concern that even though this is a nonprofit um, organization, it is, uh, it is what, uh, at least from the information that I find on the website, it is a uh, organization that advocates one particular side of what many people call, uh, would call a controversial uh, subject, uh, that is the, the uh, subject of climate change or global warming or whatever the, the buzz term is now. Um, and I, um, I, I personally, I don't think I feel comfortable with spending the taxpayers' money on a, a organization that is so clearly uh, in favor of one side of an issue. So that's my input. What's the impact? It's a two hundred dollar request mm -hmm. to offset the fees for the event that they're uh, proposing. Because it's kind of a. I mean, it is. I have to agree with Hal on this one. I'm sorry. I have to agree with Hal on this one too. That it is representing a an an opinion, and yeah, there are those that feel that it's absolutely going to happen, but there's also an opinion out there that feels differently. And when we start doing that, we could be stepping into a situation I we might not want to be in. So uh, I, it, it's I think more that I think that uh, the issue that you're talking about is one that nobody wants to be in, and that the mission of 350.org, of which we are a chapter way down the line somewhere, is certainly to uh, Enter it. <coughs> what is known by the uh, overwhelming consensus of rural scientists who've been studying this, I've been studying it since the 1960s. It's an issue that can't be ignored. In this forum, we are not going to present 350.org's position on it. We are sponsoring it as a public education event. And we're bringing climate scientists who are charged with uh, education, those listed from Western State University, to share with us how other communities have addressed the effects of cha our changing climate in their communities, both to mitigate those things that can be mitigated and to uh, uh, deal with what adaptation uh, measures can be taken. So it's it's intended as an educational event. We have not put any preamble of um, my own or, or this, uh, this group's forward. And um, we don't know, frankly, what, what those people will say, except that they're uh, responsible and qualified scientists. And uh, this grew out of our own involvement with the city's uh, uh, steps towards mitigating and adapting to changes in energy. As, as I think I mentioned in the in the prospectus, so more than that I can't say. Well, I kind of I commend you for wanting to do this. I just have a, I'm, I just don't feel comfortable being sponsoring this this type of event when there are so many different divided opinions. And unless we do the other uh, side of the coin to pr sponsor something like that, I don't I, I I don't feel like that's an area we should step into. We're not I setting it up as a debate. That's I guess I, we realize that. Yeah. I guess my opinion would be that this this group has come forward. If the other group comes forward and asks for similar amount that we will provide that. Well, well we're looking at a hundred thousand dollars that people are coming to us this next year on these kind of requests and we're gonna have to start looking at something as a criteria to kind of look at it second, you know, start cutting back somewhere. I think that's my position regardless of how I feel either direction on this is more is this truly a slight of uh, citizen's request and I'm just not sure that it is. I, I, it's not necessarily community support. That's the part that bothers me. I'd have to agree with Melody. I I think you're stepping into something that 
has people on both sides, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get involved. All right. If you want to, you want to speak? Yes, I would. Okay. Mel, are you through? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fred, you need to let, let Fred go. I suppose that you can perceive this as a controversial issue. All the major societies in the world are planning on the climate change. All of them. China, Russia, UK, California is just okayed a major study of their water fronts because of the probability that water, the ocean is going to continue to rise as it is. Many island systems in the Pacific are making plans to evacuate their citizens. This isn't really a controversial subject. All major thinking societies are planning on this. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Fred. Hey, Monica. Monica Griesenbeck, Salida. <clears throat> I, for one, would like the opportunity to hear what is going to be discussed. Uh, there may be entities out there who don't believe the ice caps are shrinking, that the ocean levels are rising, and that our children and grandchildren are going to inherit an earth that we cannot even begin to imagine. Why don't you just leave the door open for them? We're not talking about a huge amount of money. For heaven's sakes, it's just $200. I'll toss it in. Please, allow this. Thank you. I didn't think we were denying it. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, well. What? I, I, the, the, the concern I have is that if, if we approve this request for finances, then we, the city, have taken a side. And, and I, I, don't, I just don't think we ought to take a side. I, I mean, regardless of how we may feel personally, whether we agree with the side that, that this organization has taken or not, uh, that, that's... I'll restate my comment. If we support this one and the other side wants, comes forth and wants to present their side, I would consider re, uh, supporting them also. And I would point you to um, the comprehensive plan, which does have a section that does address um, the desire for the city to be somewhat pro more proactive in addressing climate change issues. It does, I think, one action item, for example, is to have the mayor consider joining uh, the mayors against climate change or whatever that organization is. So there is um, uh, some language within the comprehensive plan that does um, sort of address um, in a pragmatic way that the city should be um, taking what steps they can to um, become more resilient or to reduce our consumption to play some part in what is acknowledged as climate change. Um, and then the energy focus plan, which was more recently adopted by this council, um, again, focuses not so much on climate change, but um, there's an obvious cor correlation there in discussing the city's efforts to reduce um, consumption. We are also doing that in relationship to our footprint uh, for use of oil as opposed to what we're now going to do in solar energy. Mm -hmm. So I think the city's position, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, I don't think it's correct to say the city hasn't taken any position, mm -hmm. um, although the approach is more pragmatic. That makes more sense. I repeat again, I, 
we're not denying them the forum if they want to use the forum. We're talking about $200 that I don't feel is community support. It does not fit the definition of what I consider community support. Mel, go ahead. Yeah, I had a little difficulty hearing you a little bit, but I can uh, speak to Mr. Brown's uh, concern. Again, I want to point out that this, uh, my involvement in this uh, includes reading your city energy focus plan that you uh, passed last year, participating in one of those planning events. And it is, the forum is not set up as a, deba a debate about climate change as such, a pro or con. It is or it isn't happening. But it's to share information with people in this community about how other communities <coughs> have addressed what they see as a challenge to their way of life, their use and of energy and resources. And I think <coughs> what these people are talking about is indicated by their own words in, in the agenda of the Forum for the Plan. So that's, that's I what think I think we're about. I think I heard. Yeah, it's not about my opinion. <coughs> it's not about opinions versus opinions. That's not the, the form. I think I heard agenda. a community activist offer you the $200. Does that take care of it? I'm sorry? We just heard a community activist offer to pay you $200. It, does that take care of your request? All we're asking for at this time is, is because we're a, a small and young group, some assistance in meeting our, and to advertise the event, yes, the $200. So That's that all we're asking <coughs> for you from then. If at that this time. satisfies your request for $200 and it keeps the city out of it, well, you're we don't want to step into it right now. But we heard an offer of the uh, $200. <laughs> It might be a little hard if somebody asked you, where'd you get the money, <laughs> you know, well, it came from the city. Um, no, it didn't. It came from a community act. Oh, all right, that's what you're saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would prefer, you know, this is my personal preference, okay. I would prefer that uh, we could work with the city. You know, we, we have tried to frame this thing in support of what the city's future vision is as expressed in its own energy focus plan. That's as important as just the two hundred dollars. So, mm. so. Which says you want to, you want the city to commit. Yeah. To yeah. the program, and I'm not. Okay. Ready to uh, I make a motion that we uh, uh, provide two hundred dollars uh, for the waiver, re uh, the fee waiver request, etc., uh, for the um, what's it called, the eight fifty three fifty. Organization. No second. No second. No second. This motion failed. Thank you, ma'am. For clarity, it may be worthwhile to have a motion to deny. Pardon? For clarity, it may be worth having a motion to deny. So there's actually an, a, an action one way or the other to close the matter. Okay. He's asking for a motion to deny. You know. To deny? Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, yeah. There was no second, though. I know. So no nothing's second. happened. That's my right. point. Exactly. So What's the action? Then, Mr. Mayor, I offer a motion to deny the request for $200 from 350 CC. Okay. Second. Motion, second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Motion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mel. Okay, and next item. Okay, the amendment for the emergency telephone char uh, charges Second reading and public hearing. Uh, Russ. Sergeant Johnson, Slide of Police Department. Uh, Mayor, Council, what you have before you here is a second reading, so I'll keep it brief. 
We're asking to approve the Salada Municipal Code, Section 5.2.10 and 5.2.20 to reflect current CRS language and statutes. The uh, old one has 2911-101. The statute's been changed by the state to 2911-102. And also there's some language about a 50 cent fee that's been in there for a lot of years and the fee is now currently moving to $1.40 in October. So we just need to clean that up and uh, make it so it reflects the state statute. Your Honor. Um, just please um, note it is a public hearing. We got a public hearing on this. I thought I'd put the motion on the floor. No? Public so hearing. Public after hearing after first. Hearing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll open the public hearing. Okay. No one? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Now, now your motion. Your Honor, I make a motion that uh, we approve Ordinance 2014-26, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Salida, Colorado, amending sections of the Municipal Code, Section 5-2-10 and 5-2-20, emergency telephone charges of the Municipal Code, setting a public and, hearing. Um, this part wasn't updated on the memo, so we just need to order it um, published by title only. And the public hearing. Published by title only. Yep. Sorry about that. Second. Motion and second uh, discussion. Uh, I would suggest, and I think you guys are going to do this anyway, is that we go after those cell phone charges that are registered in other jurisdictions make a really concerted effort to do that. I don't know how much money that would involve, but it seems to be getting bigger and bigger. Because every time I get a phone call now, I don't even know where it's coming from, and I find it's coming from a local resident, so. I can't speak for the board, but I have had talks with Chief Clark, and they're looking into that. Good. Thank you. Okay. okay. We'll, uh, we, need a, we don't need a real roll call. call. Roll call. Okay. Yes. Brown? Yes. Hallett? Yes. Rogers? Yes. In your key. Yes. This motion is carried. <coughs> Next item, Colorado Department. Oh. We're going to have we, discussions here. We moved that here. to. We're just going to have we moved comment that. and discussion. Pardon. Discussion. Okay. Section for Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, good evening. I'd like to introduce Resolution 2014-69, a memorandum of understanding between the City of Salida and the Colorado Department of Transportation for restriping on Highway 50. This was originally brought before the Council um, at a work session, I believe, on June 16th, 2014. Mike McVaugh, CDOT engineer for this region, walked the council through a, a variety of different options. This has been through a number of public hearings and public meetings um, as we've contemplated the different um, options that would be available for Highway 50. Overall, this is really to create a multimodal transportation corridor <coughs> on Highway 50, specifically for the purpose of improving safety, reducing um, vehicular speeds, and providing a, a, a safer environment for folks traveling by a variety of different means through that corridor. Since this was presented to you, we've had continuing conversations with CDOT and Mike McVaugh that kind of brings us to this new cross-section that we have here. 
um, a couple of conditions of the road. Um, the original assumption was that it was a 60, 68 foot right of way. Field verification has actually shown that that's a little bit narrower than it is. So that's driven some of the modifications that you see here. Originally we had an 11 foot outside lane with a 10 foot inside lane. And based on comments that we've received from the public, concerns that we've had, we want to make sure that we have as much space as we can in those areas. So with this new cross section, we've narrowed the bike lane, we've narrowed the buffer, and we've been able to widen that inside lane to provide a little additional room for the car. We've left the uh, two-way left, uh, the center lane, uh, unchanged from the original plan. So effectively, you'll have a five-foot bike lane moving into a one-and-a-half-foot striped buffer into a 10 and a half foot drive lane, a second 10 and a half foot drive lane into the center median, which will remain at 11 feet. And then um, it'll be a similar cross section on the other side of the road. Um, we've had this discussion and CDOT is um, in favor of, of this option. And I'd be happy to stand for questions. Just for, clarif just for clarification, I would ask, uh, talk to what we have been told over and over and over again by our CDOT representative in this area. Uh, there's a conception out there that we can simply pass an ordinance and change the speed limit on a state highway. And it does say that, but the next paragraph says only at the discretion of the CDOT engineer. And the CDOT engineer has made it very clear to us that he will not authorize that. That's correct. I've, I've heard that same partial reading, but in, in total, you're exactly right. That, that's a CDOT highway. They have ultimate jurisdiction on that. Um, they would certainly potentially take it into consideration, but Mike has indicated to us that that would not be a preferred option for them and that they may or may not support that. My understanding is that would be questionable. Re remind me again how many entry and exit points there are along that stretch of highway. I don't have an exact number for you, Hal, but there's a lot is for that, sure. Yeah, I, I guess I have heard there, a I was, Yeah, I was going to say 140, <laughs> but I don't yeah. want to misspeak. Yeah. You know, I'd hate to get bad information out there. Yeah. Do you have a question? Oh. Go to the public. Oh. Yeah. Oh, can I ask? If you can come up here. Okay. Okay, so for those of you that don't know me, my Ken, name is Ken yeah. Barrett. Okay. okay, I do have questions of uh, this on the change from my conversations before with Mike Mavaugh after the meetings and stuff. One of the things he had said of changing the speed limit on Highway 50 to like 30 or 35 if that was the only thing that, because it was a business district, he wouldn't sign off on it. But now, actually, the state has agree, agreed to doing a entryway signs and also reduced speed limit signs, whether they were the flashing ones that just gave the speed limit or the radar ones that would show that. Okay, my basic concern is for the safety of the highway. I have more than 20 years in emergency services, and I see what happens. Big always wins. Whether it's a semi against a car, semi against a truck, a car versus a bicycle, car versus a pedestrian. My concern is that highway is very narrow, and if you drive out there even today with the way lane widths the way they are, when you see these two big rigs coming there, I just don't feel safe with that. One of the things, bicycles are allowed on that highway at any time. I would much rather have a bicycle straighten the lane ahead of me and go 10 miles an hour until the traffic on the left is clear that I could go around him, rather than have him off in a blind side. And I mean, I have a, you know, uh, 1999 motorhome and if any of you want to drive it up and down there and see how comfortable you feel with someone in a small lane 
off to the side of you and you want to make a right hand turn, you're more than willing to drive it. I'll be happy uh, on that. One of the things that the state can do a lot of things that would help that highway. One of the things is that down by 7-Eleven and however often it's needed, the state could put a sign, westbound traffic, keep in the left lane. One of the things that would help our traffic in this town is, with all of these intersections coming there, these people waiting on these numbered and uh, lettered streets trying to get on the highway headed west, that would give them ample opportunity to get there. One of the things that I notice is that the longer somebody has to wait at a stop sign, the shorter the safe distance comes to pull out in the front of a vehicle. So that would be a simple thing. Headed east from Walmart, they should put a sign through traffic, stay in the right lane. One of the things that that helps is these same intersections, people trying to head east to 7-Eleven would have a lot easier time getting out in that lane if all the traffic heading through was on the right hand side. That would be a simple thing. You know, and I have brought it up to several council members before and to the mayor of what the rules say. And you know, from what Mike had said, yes, he is not the last word in this. It's his supervisor that is the last word. He just said he would not sign off on just being a business district, you know. And I would ask, you know, any bicyclists or whatever here, would they feel safer on the highway if the speed was at 30 or 35 rather than 40 or 45? Councilman Bowers at the last meeting had asked CDOT, is the speed going to change? And Mike said, I can't tell you that. After that meeting, there was a nice uh, older gentleman that was here that had previously worked for CDOT. And him and Mike were out there talking and I waited my turn to talk. And one of the things that that older gentleman had said to Mike is, now you do realize after the motel, that's rural highway. That's 55 mile an hour highway. And Mike said, yes, but I probably won't raise the speed limit to over 50. Why are we trying to do this? You know, you people took an oath in this office to serve and protect the public, okay? And this goes from giving a safe drinking water to taking care of our sewer, taking care of our streets and highways. I mean, uh, I think it's very unsafe to me. Thanks, Ken. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You know, I want to ask, when did we pass this five-minute rule? I, you know, particularly on the public comment section, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't seem <coughs> to have a lot of infractions in that area. I just kind of find that it rushes some things up that maybe somebody might have a little bit more to say. Okay. I, I, I would like, yes, I uh, appreciate, Ken, your uh, comments, and uh, I, I have uh, also, ever since this subject first came up, I've paid a lot more attention uh, and been much more aware of my situation and uh, my surroundings when I'm driving on Highway 50. and. Um, I had occasion this past weekend to drive on Academy Boulevard um, in Colorado Springs, and, and the lanes there are noticeably narrower than what we have on Highway 50 through town, and uh, there's pretty heavy traffic and pretty fast, and uh, I gotta tell you, I felt very nervous. Um, of course, country boy in the big city, I guess that's uh, understandable anyway. but. Over and above the, the width of the lane, the thing that I've been particularly aware of and is a, of great concern to me is trying to enter the highway from the side. Not, not just from an intersection, but from a parking lot at a business. And, and as I sit and I look and I'm clocking and, and just like Ken said, the longer you have to wait, 
the, the smaller your perception of what a safe distance is. Uh, and and I, I ask myself, if I was sitting here, okay, you know, it's clear that way, and I'll do, oh, damn, there's a car coming that way, and okay, it's clear that way, and, 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 and if I had to clock all those cars going two lanes in, in from either way, and then I finally see a spot that I think I'm going to be able to get out safely without getting hit by a car, and I look, and there's a bicycle, and there's another one 10 seconds behind him, and I, I just... Uh, we had a lot of public input um, at one of the earlier meetings from um, cycling enthusiasts who think that it would be safer for them if we put these bike lanes in. And um, I don't think I agree. And just by happenstance, I had a conversation with a neighbor of mine today who is an avid cyclist and, in fact, who owns a bicycle shop. And he told me he didn't think it was a good idea. Um, he said, "Just you know, just painting a lane doesn't make it safer for bicycles." That's his personal opinion, and and that's mine also. Combine that with the fact that doing this will not lower the speed limit. We, we're going to have to do. If we want the speed limit lower, we're going to have to take other measures. We're going to have to to work some other uh, uh, issues. We have not been absolutely totally told that under no circumstances can we get the speed limit lowered. Is that a true statement, Dan? Much of this is before my time, so I don't know that I can make a definitive statement on this. What I would tell you, however, is that each of these incremental steps are all part of the toolkit that we have that CDOT will consider as they consider lowering the speed limit. Yeah. The more that we can implement these safe street um, designs, the more likely they would be to lower that speed limit overall. I'd like to make a few comments. Um, Ken, I too have an RV, and I drove it across Wolf Creek Pass and a lot of other places in Colorado this summer. Uh, I was particularly impressed in Del Norte, where they have done the paint job. Now, there's a different configuration than what we have, but there was no question in my mind as I drove through that little city uh, of how calm the traffic was. I also have driven many times down to Alamosa because we have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren now down there. And the chain configuration changes that they have made in that city has made it much more safe. Uh, even when there's two semis, at least they, uh, they're all going in the same direction. They have two different uh, streets now. Um, I can't, I, no, I, I did not pick up those, that information. What I want to say is I believe that calming the traffic is going to help us no matter which format we use. We need to slow people down to, re to watch each other's driving. Whether there's bicyclers, whether there's scooters, you name it, the, we need to be more careful. And I really do believe that this form of calming is going to help us do that. My ultimate goal is to slow the speed down and we were told directly if we don't do something, they're going to increase the speed limit, point blank. That's what they said. So if we don't do something, the speed limit is going to go up based on the study they did. Did they tell Buena Vista that when they, they have a slower speed limit? I don't care what they told yeah. Buena Vista. That's what they told us. Mm -hmm. They said it point blank. Am I right, Dara? Yep, they uh, have a speed study that supports increasing uh, the speed limits in some of the areas on Highway 50. Uh, again, we've had a lot of conversations with CDOT over the years about how to lower the speed limit on Highway 50. And one of the things they tell us is we always point uh, all the other communities on Highway 50 with lower speeds, and they say, that's great for them. Those speed limits have been in there for a long time. If they ever did a traffic study, they wouldn't, they wouldn't stand. We would likely look at raising them and that the the way to work with CDOT to achieve a lower speed is to make alterations in the physical environment. Um, and that's where the restriping comes in, in addition to the signage. Um, Mike has told us repeatedly that signage alone will not achieve um, a reduction in the speed limit. But he feels 
It's not going to give you a guarantee, but he feels confident, confident that with um, the restriping and a uh, combination of additional signage um, alerting drivers about the speed limit and to the use caution with, along with um, <coughs> the rapid rectangular flashing beacons for pedestrian crossings that it will result in an environment that they can safely do a speed study and um, implement a lower speed limit in this area. I kind of see this as CDOT wants bike lanes no matter what and they're doing it all across the country and how whatever means they're going to use it sounds like that's what we're going to get forced to do. Any more, Dan? You have any more? There's some folks out there. That okay. Well, we're going to open this up. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. I'm kind of curious to what happened when the uh, you did a survey and the majority of the people said don't change anything. Now. The whole idea of bicycle ranges is, is really uh, a, a farce because I'm a bicycle rider and no bicycle rider that I know is going to ride on Highway 50. There's too many ways to avoid it. Uh, when I go to the gym, there's a lot of bicycles there, but they don't go down hi Highway 50. Since we started this, uh, this uh, discussion, I've been watching out there and interestingly, there although I don't spend a lot of time on Highway 50, I must admit, but I've only seen one bicycle rider on Highway 50, and that was down by Big O. I've seen a few bicycle riders crossing the r highway, but nobody riding on, the, on Highway 50. Uh, has anybody ever done a, uh, a study of how many people actually ride on Highway 50? I don't think any do. They're not crazy, and so this is basically just kind of a farce to accomplish some other end. I think it's uh, in, an indirect way to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. And it's going to just, it, it, it will not be used, bicycle riders will not use those lanes because we don't ride on Highway 50. So that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, Vernon Davis, Slida. I was at that meeting, Keith. I don't want to drive 50 mile an hour down. I don't either. <laughs> and that th Not at my age. <laughs> that's what scares me because I have to go out on that highway. Well, you told us about trying to turn into day. work. Yeah. And uh, it is not easy. I spoke at one of the CDOT meetings, and Nancy and I had spoke to a couple truckers, actually three out at Poncha Springs, and they were talking about like Domino's Pizza, how that road is not a 90 degree, but <laughs> about 120, and there are several in this town. And what they said is they have to pull out and take both lanes to make their turn, and when they get their tractor to this point, they cannot see if there's a bike or something else in that lane. They just have to hope people see their truck. So I'm wondering, since I brought that up the meeting, has anyone talked to anyone in the trucking industry about narrowing the lanes, the effects on them? Has anyone talked to local trucking, contractors, distributors, about turning on streets that are more than 90 degrees? And I'm wondering what the county commissioners have had to say about it. It's, this is in the county too. I wonder if anybody's talked to the county commissioners about what they feel. Um, they did have the counter strips out there maybe a month ago. I wonder if we've got a report yet on uh, traffic through Salida. They said at their meetings there's around 13,000 a day. Seemed like it was a lot higher this summer. I just wonder if, if we got any reports back from them on that. Not that I'm aware of. I don't believe we've received um, reports. The traffic counts for CDOT are available on the CDOT website. Are they? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vern. Cinder Green Slider. Um, Dan, is it? Um, Address your questions to us, please. 
I couldn't hear what he said, what the new widths were and what the new total um, width of the highway was. The, he said it wasn't what the diagram in the packet is. Is that? I don't have my reading glasses. 60 feet in. Five, one and a half, ten and a half. And this all adds up to? 66. To 66? Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> 45. Um, Eileen, I've, I drive through Del Norte quite a bit, and yeah, it's, it, I believe they have single lanes going each direction, and then they have a turn both ways lane, and they have. Parking. Is sides. it diagonal or pa it's diagonal parking no, or parallel? parallel? And parallel then they have the bike, sides. parallel parking, bike lane, one lane going each way. And the lanes are not narrow. I don't, think they are. I don't think so. I think the the driving lanes are 12 feet, and I think the turn lane is is wider. I mean, I would actually. My concern is, is the the width of these lanes, and I, I sent you guys my little diagram, and apparently it's even two feet smaller than this now, um, of what it's like when you're going to have semis on there and <coughs> RVs. I mean, I would, I would actually prefer, although I know nobody else would, that you actually removed a lane and made it a four-lane highway, and uh, then it would at least be safer. I mean, how are these trucks going to turn? It's not safe. It isn't, I don't care what, you can write, you can write that it is safe, or it can say in the packet that it's safer, but it is not going to be safer. I don't care what speed you get. This is how big uh, semi uh, parking spaces are, nine and 10 feet wide. And that's just sitting there. And RV drivers don't, m most truck drivers are fairly professional and drive well, but you know, RV drivers don't. <coughs> I, I, you know, I go all over the road just because that's the way I drive, unfortunately. But, <laughs> but um, I just don't think it's safe. That's as I've said to you. Thanks. Thanks, Enda. In simple form, I think I agree with you, Keith. We have no choice. If we want 50 mile an hour speed limit out there. We're going to do something. We or we're going to end up with 50 yeah. mile, 55 mile an I hour cannot. speed limit. That's what we were told. Monica. Monica Griesenbeck. Um, I'm kind of curious, why did the city request a speed study when they were told the result of that speed study might not be what we'd like to hear? We did not request it. You did not request it. I've been meeting, told that the city I, requested it. I, was, I know what you were told, but I was at that meeting also, along with Senator Schwartz. Part of our police department was there also. And the guy says, I want to warn you. It wasn't this guy that we've been dealing with. It's another one. He says, I want to warn you. If this study goes through, it could raise the speed limit. And we all at that table said, do not do the speed limit. And the next thing we know, we re or the t uh, survey, the next thing we know, they did it on their own. We specifically at that table, sitting in the steam plant upstairs, told them, do not do that study. And they did it anyway. That's very interesting because at one of the meetings I attended, Engineer McVaugh and Ms. McDonald were pointing fingers at each other. That's exactly right. Ms. McDonald was right. Everyone sitting at that table said no. Now, it wasn't the guy, Mike. It was another guy that was there. I have another question. Why, over all these years that I've lived here, we don't seem to use our police department to enforce the speed limit that exists. I have never seen anybody, I'm sure it's happened, but I have rarely, I've seen a lot of speeding going on. We all have on, on Highway 50. I've never seen anybody pulled over for it. I've been. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us about it. <laughs> it's a long time ago, long time. 
Most folks, I mean local <laughs> folks, um, because there's so many signs and so much confusion out there, and as somebody mentioned, a whole lot of curb cuts, uh, you tend to drive slower already. We already have traffic calling devices. It's 149 curb cuts. You're looking for a certain business out there. You're going to slow down. I never drive the speed limit on that section between Ullman Avenue and the 7-Eleven when you leave town. I've always felt, why not just uh, approach it in the simplest way possible, which is enforce the speed limit. Let it be known. You speed out there, you're going to pay. And I haven't seen that happen. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Brenda Wired, Salida. Just a real brief um, note that I am in support of the change because if we don't do the change, the speed limit will go up. And I think that is the critical thing. We don't want that to turn into a freeway. So thank you. <laughs> I just thought of one other item. Thank you very much. One other item. If I recall right, and those of you who know uh, the highways, Alamosa did a calming that they didn't like, and they changed it. So, you know, this isn't a, it's paint. Uh, you know, dyed in the wool, can't change something down the line. Let's try it. So would we not want to make this an ordinance then so that it can be changed as opposed to a resolution? Is that how, what would make that more feasible? Uh, am I? The form of approval wouldn't. I mean, the ordinance would be more permanent than the resolution. I mean, I think that really all the resolution is is just a method of approving the memorandum of understanding between CDOT and the city regarding what this is. Um, you know, it would be going back and having that conversation with CDOT if, if it was determined that you wanted to change what was going on. Or similarly, if they decided they wanted to see a change out there, it would have to be reflected in an update to that memorandum of understanding. And so the other, the, the way it's approved isn't necessarily okay. And the other question is, is if why does this need to be between Dara? Would it not be the council that might want to do this memorandum of understanding so that there's instead of broadening the powers there, I think the council should be the one that should be. I, I, uh, I mean, I I think it was just the way it was. It could be the mayor's signature. It could be Dara's signature. It's just the authorized representative of the city. Obviously, it has to be approved by you all. So um, whichever signature you'd like to have on the agreement, I think, is fine. What, what's the level of commitment in this memorandum of understanding for these future events that are mentioned? It's fairly vague. <laughs> it's, it's basically stating the intent to pursue it. Um, we know that we are already um, hopefully going out to bid here in November for the one rapid rectangular flashing beacon pedestrian crossing and one um, your speed flashing sign. Um, and so it's expressing the intent of the city to pursue um, additional measures in the coming years, but there's not a hard um, timeline or, or anything like that. And doesn't commit us to fund any future things until we're ready to do that. Then. Correct. Correct. Right. And the striping is in the budget already? The striping is not in our current budget. Oh, my, my mistake. Yes. Hmm. So this is 15 money? The striping, they would like to go ahead and do this fall. 14 money. 14 money. So their proposal on the restriping is that they would share the cost of the restriping because there has to be grinding associated with that. So they would share the cost of the restriping with the city this fall. And then they would maintain it going forward. And I know there was a number in some our previous discussion. Would, would, would refresh my memory on that? Do you have that, Dan? I do. Give me just, just a minute here, Hal. I think I've got it in this packet. 
the, the entire piece was 9,000, I want to say it was around $9,000 a mile, and then our portion of that was about a third, if I recall. I think it was half. Was it, did it go half? Some of those were details that were, again, I hate to say before my time, but those were through the negotiations earlier. Unfortunately, I don't have that right here in front of me, but the total number was around 9,000 a mile, and then that would be subject to, to that split with us. So 4,500? Per mile. Per mile. Yeah, per mile. I think it came out held in 9,000. About yeah, 9, 10,000. I had 10,000 number in my yeah. head for some that, reason. That, yeah. that, that sounds a ballpark. Now Mike has asked us to table this yeah, until, until, until he can meeting. be here. Yep. Does that work time-wise with your? Sure. I, Barring as of, th at this morning when they first told us the highway width had changed that uh, we were just going to pull it off the agenda. So yeah, it, it can still work. Okay. So I would suggest we table it until Mike can be here. Mm -hmm. Continue to the next meeting. Continue. Continue. So is that a motion to continue to the October 7th meeting? That was. I'll second that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Vote. We have a, we got a motion and a second to continue. Do you have a motion? Oh, do you have to yep. We did. Okay. We did. We got a second. Yep. Okay. We need to vote. And a roll call. Roll call. Mm, voice, voice vote, vote is fine. fine. Pardon? Voice vote is fine on this on okay. the motion to continue. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. This motion is carried. Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you. Okay. You wanted to vote on it tonight? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> take that back. I'm sorry. <laughs> It doesn't matter, but it's just kind she of shocking. That's, a, right, 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 right. That, that's okay, Mel timeline? Melody. We will tell Mike that you didn't want to let him talk on this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think we have Mike talk to her when he gets back. Uh, there you go. Uh, oh, boy. Okay, next item. Water treatment plant phase two bid award. Bob. Good evening. Uh, last time I was here, you were nice enough to award the bid to Moltz for a two million gallon a day upgrade and at that time you instructed us to look and see if there was a chance that uh, we could uh, get to a four million because the numbers came in very reasonable. Uh, we uh, the, the total price last time was a million eighty thousand seven hundred and thirty eight for a two million gallon and the pre-purchase of the equipment and everything what it what it all amounted to was one million two hundred forty four thousand five eighty eight now if we go to the four million gallon a day plant it'll be two hundred sixty nine thousand four seventeen and it's very close to the amount that we had figured and budgeted in the first place uh, the upgrade will cost us an additional 20000 plus an upgrade of $6,000 for windows, if we can do that. And, you know, the numbers have been all looked over, scrutinized, and we would like to upgrade to $4 million and the revised number is five. Staff is recommending that the council award the job at the revised bid price up to that $1,777,805 worth of work. Um, I think it is a very good thing to do. The prices have come in well. Uh, we don't know what can happen down in the future, and at this time, when you are lucky enough to have somebody paying 50 cents on a dollar for an improvement like this. I, I think it'd be very hard to pass up. If we ever need to go to four million a day, we don't know that we're gonna have anybody out there offering to hand us some, some money toward it. Um, there's a lot of, of good things to do and it gives us more alternatives. So, you know, any any questions or where would what's you like it, to go with this? What's the difference between two million and four million? The um, I'm seeing roughly ninety three thousand. Ninety three thousand. Yeah. Am I correct on that? 
I thought it was 269,417. Uh, I That's think correct. we had a revised bid, didn't we? The, yeah. Yeah. So bringing it, the difference above what we, the approved budget, the previously approved budget is about $20,000, $20,000. Um, the increase from going for from two million gallons per day to four million gallons per day is the two hundred and sixty nine thousand so because the original bid had come in so much lower we 're able to make up the vast majority of that difference uh, within the already discussed budget so it 's only about twenty thousand over over the previously approved budget for the project correct yeah, yeah. Okay. and then we had talked. Um, during the site visit and uh, something Lonnie had brought up more recently about the need to replace the windows. Lonnie has subsequently uh, received a bid for that of $6,000 to replace those um, windows at the plant, at the current existing plant. So we would uh, recommend just getting it all done at once, uh, but that's certainly up to you guys. Your Honor, I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 2014-70, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Salida, Colorado, approving the award in, of an agreement for the water treatment plant improvement phase two and authorizing the city administrator to enter a, into a construction services agreement between the city and Maltz Construction. Second. I, I have some questions. Um, when you, you use the word need to say someday we might need it, as, as I understand that we don't have a current need for that capacity? No, I, I, I'm not going to tell you that we have a current need for it. Um, but I, we don't know what can happen in the future. Uh, its proximity to the galleries makes it a very good place to treat water should we ever need to treat water from, from the galleries. Mm -hmm. um, if there is growth, which um, the economy seems to be moving along right now, none of us can tell in the future what may happen. But I, yeah, as I said when in my opening statement, I'd really hate for something to happen in five or ten years where equipment can change, uh, prices certainly go up, the cost of going back in again is, is high, and um, right now we have somebody paying Fifty cents on a dollar to, to help us out. It, it's it's hard for me to think that the economics is not a good thing. Well, it's it's um, it, it's uh, last night we had some considerable discussion and we were uh, concerned about preserving or protecting the uh, reserves in the enterprise fund. And now we're talking about spending uh, uh, two hundred seventy thousand dollars that we could potentially not say uh, spend well half of that yeah no. half, of, half that of it's paid for by Dola oh okay so, so but yes it's still a substantial amount of money yes um, 135,000 and thanks <laughs> and the uh, the other uh, the other thing that I'm looking at here which which is a cause of concern for me is SGM engineering fees $17,000 against a uh, $97,000 construction. That's uh, between 17 and 18 percent of construction cost for engineering. And that's, that's anywhere from Oops, um, three or four or five or six times a normal. Actually, so not a part of the, it's just for the redrawing of the, the plans, really, the 17,000. They're actually not increasing anything in their construction management. Uh, for this, but they need to redo all the plan documents. So that, my understanding that's, is that's what the 17000 is for. To me, that's still a huge figure for that much construction. Mm -hmm. And um, Well, think about it. It's the plans are for the entire project, not, and so they need to modify the plans now for the change. So I don't know if it's traditionally when you think of the engineering costs or the design as a percentage of construction, this is a little bit out of the norm. Um, because now they're going back and modifying the complete plan set for the whole project, not um, just for this section of it. Well, it, this just this just goes into a bigger bucket of concern I have about SGM and their engineering, and their cost, mm -hmm. and their estimates, uh, which we've we, had some. We all we all share your concern. At this time, I don't think that it's a good time to um, 
you know, jump off the horse. You know, we can do that at some point, but well, I don't think it right now would be the time. We we can still, you know, and and I understand that economically, you know, gosh, it's a bargain. Let's let's do it now. But on the other hand, we've been talking a lot about the fact that we're get very very tight on money. Uh, reserves uh, are drawing down, um, and uh, now we're going to draw reserves down another 135,000 or whatever that number turns out to be uh, when we don't have a documented need for that additional capacity, and we don't know when we will. Uh, there's what is. And at one of these one of these previous meetings, there was uh, some numbers that were presented um, that were uh, that showed what the peak demands were over periods of time. And I, as I recall, that we had very very few. Okay. Um, it, with your permission, I think it'd be good for Lonnie, the plant supervisor, to um, maybe he can explain some of these numbers and his feeling about why the the uh, change from two to four would be a good thing. Okay. With your permission. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the things that I think you really need to consider in going from the two to the four is your water rights are surface rights. They can be used in the AUG plan. Uh, the gallery system we still have to test. That produces about a million, three million, four gallons a day. Uh, by going to going to four million gallons now, at this uh, this, which I consider a real good price. I mean, you'll it'll never happen again for for this money, but that gives you the ability by bringing that plant to four million gallons. That if something happens to your gallery system something happens to Pasquale Springs, you have a plant in itself that can produce water to Salida without any interruption. And I think, you know, to me that is worth a lot. And the price that has been proposed compared to coming in later on, say we find a problem at the galleries, we don't know. There, there could be. To come back and add that later will cost you far more than to bring it to the four million gallons right now. I understand that. But the fact is we are really strapped for cash right now. Uh, at least that's what I thought I heard last night. The enterprise? Well, I disagree with, with that. The yeah, we'll be pulling out of out of reserves, but we got 1.7 so, so million. So we would left. have to pull that much more out of the wastewater fund mm -hmm. reserves. Mm -hmm. And understanding, you know, that you're committing to doing a large, one time, once every 20, 30, 40 year project. So it's not a, an ongoing expectation that you'll continue to draw down reserves for this. The city had anticipated the reconstruction of this plant and had raised. The rates accordingly to be able to afford this, and you've been able to accelerate that timeline substantially through obtaining grant funding and leveraging your funds, um, and we'll be able to move forward in a more positive direction much sooner um, with a large chunk of the capital anticipated um, well behind you. Yeah, and I, it all sounds very good until you uh, until you want to jack up the water and sewer rates again because uh, we're drawing down reserves. Now, if you could tell me, hey, we could, we could do this and not raise rates, I think it'd be fantastic. But you also can't do it in 10 years from now if you need it and not raise rates. I mean, if, if it comes later. It'll have to be paid for some way. Yeah, pay me now or pay me later is always the mantra. Pay half now or pay full later. Thanks, Lonnie. 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Got a motion? Do we have a motion? Oh, one other, one other question. I'm sorry. Um, were, how many bidders were there on this project? I believe there were three. Were, were the other bidders offered the opportunity to bid on the expanded package? We, yeah, and we took a look at it, and and it really, you guys already awarded this contract. This is really in the nature of a change order. Um, to that contract, that's that's the difference. Is yeah. we I right, took a hard look at it, kind of legally as well, and just since that award had already been made, when these numbers came in, it really amounted to a change order on the project. Um, and actually, at two sixty nine, at um, you know. Okay. It's not a biggest change yeah. order or something that you would see. I, I can see where you're hesitant, Al, and why. You know, there's, it's money. Um, so you got to balance that. I think this, you know, in my mind, it, it balances toward making the project work. But, you know, there's... It's yeah, I, I got to admit, you make a good case, and like, uh, the, you know, it boils down to my only... My only concern now is the fact that this just one more place that puts upward pressure on uh, water and sewer rates, and uh, you know we got we've got good rates. They're still cheaper than cable TV. Mm, yeah. Is that about the difference in the pay raises if we get the two percent? Doesn't have anything to do with this. Well, we're talking about money. That's doesn't <coughs> have anything to do with this. Let's vote. Need a motion. I did. Yeah. There is a motion. A motion and a second on the Oh, you got a motion and a second. <laughs> well, since it involves money, we need a roll call. That's great. Your key. Yes. Rogers. Yes. Ellett. Yes. Brown. No. And Baker. Yes. This motion is carried. Thank you. Next item, Chief County Memorandum of Agreement concerning vital records there. Okay. So this is, um, as you know, the city of Salida is the vital records provider in um, Chafee County. We had entered into uh, an agreement with Chafee County a few years ago in 2010, acknowledging that the city is the party that's um, acting uh, in that capacity, as well as at that time, Buena Vista. Buena Vista subsequently um, stopped um, providing that service uh, up north, and so the city is the only entity now providing um, birth and death certificates. The county had reflect, um, requested that we update the agreement simply to reflect that Buena Vista is no longer a party. Um, so just same agreement, pulling BV out. Um, any questions? This is basically a paperwork thing? Absolutely. Okay. There's no change in. So who's doing the, uh, is this the clerk's job? We have, um, it's under the, our department. Uh, we primarily see um, the staff on the other side of the hall and the finance side uh, processing the birth and death certificate requests. Okay, and let me, uh, I'm sorry if I'm seemingly dense here. There's a fancy name for um, what that designee is called, and I can't recall it, um, under the state. And it's um, primarily they're handled by our, our administrative staff on the other side of the um, hall. So, so who so keeps these records? They're all online now. Okay. For the most part. Um, so we can actually provide, um, in the recent years, we've gone to an all online system through the state so we can provide the certificates for um, anyone born anywhere in the state now, um, not just in Chafee County. So, it's so this is the state service. that really is in yes, charge? Yes, this is a of service okay. of the state. And they do um, take some of the revenue as well, if the state does. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to approve resolution 2014-71 Resolution of the City Council of the City of Slida, Colorado, approving an updated memorandum of, memorandum of agreement designated 
designating the city as Registrar for Vital Statistics for the County. Second. We have a motion and a second discussion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion is passed. Next item, budget amendment and agreement professional services or workshop design for a wave finding signage. Dan. Mr. Mayor, Council, I'd like to introduce Resolution 2014-72, a budget amendment for the Professional Service Agreement for Wayfinding Signage. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the details of the background for the Wayfinding Signage program. I'll just say that we're in the process of implementing a plan that was approved by Council previously. We had taken this out um, to bid and workshop design came in significantly lower than any of the other bids by about half. And I have to say they've been fantastic to work with and um, very cognizant of our desire to stay under budget and get this project moving forward. Um, the revised bud, um, bid sheet that I just presented you, the one that's in your packet has the uh, first item number one, um, has a number of 3840. That number actually is revised down to 36240. And that's through our kind of working with um, workshop design and the different partners. We've actually reduced the number of si total signs in some areas and brought that number down. So that keeps us under budget and offsets some of the additional signs. The additional signs are actually back panels. So this is the destination sign here that you see. These will be at the uh, parks and um, like at the water or at the um, aquatic center, Riverside Park, places like that. And then working with Terry, Chief Clark and um, some of our different partners on this, they felt it was very important to have the rules put on the back of the sign to where they're right up front. Anybody who's using the park would know that the rules were there. If there were ever an occasion where somebody were to be ticketed, they can't say, I didn't know what the rules were. We've got them right there on the insurance signs. So we were able to reduce the number of some signs, and then we added some additional panels um, for this purpose. So that's kind of where that change was. And ultimately, that ends up being an $1,800 increase to what we had anticipated for that portion of the, um, of the contract. And that's why we're coming back for that piece tonight. So it actually ends up being about $1,800 more. What, were, what did we have in the budget? The total budget was $100,000 less, $10,000 for the, um, the Creative Sign District. Of that, we, we had budgeted with uh, workshop design, I think it was 47,616. We're going to be increasing that number by 1,800 for this piece of it. The second piece, which is the bigger number, that's that 14,000 number. That's actually for the signs. You see the posts on the sign and all of the mounting hardware. That wasn't originally included in the bid from workshop design. However, they're able to provide that to us. And in looking at the design, we felt that it was a very attractive and aesthetically pleasing design. And then working with, um, with our public works folks, they're able to provide that portion of the mounting hardware to us at a price that we can't get anywhere else. So we thought we would just go ahead and roll that in and be able, so what they'll essentially do is deliver to us a final, a finished product that then our utilities department will be able to put directly into the ground. They'll be able to go out there and, and mount those and put those in the parks for us. We will come back to, uh, to council for, at some point, uh, to do an additional bid for the highway signs on CDOT. That was part of the original plan. And then the rest of the signage will be put up by our parks folks and we'll procure um, the posts and mounting hardware for those ourselves. And that should, again, continue to ratchet down the, the total project costs so we can uh, stay within that budget. So we're trying to kind of find the places where we can, we can do it ourselves and provide that service to the community ourselves at a lower cost. But this one, they just do such a nice job. Our, our guys wouldn't be able to put this together um, at the same level of detail and 
Um, what's what's the timing on this, Dan? Um, we get this approved. I can go ahead and get them to start fabricating signs tomorrow. And delivery? Four to six weeks. Four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. Like I said, they've been fantastic to work with. We've really been pleased. What is the motion? Oh, there it is. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to approve, uh, make a resolution City Council, City, Council, City of Slide, Colorado, approving the amendment a fabrication contract for the wayfinding signs and authorizing city administrator to amend the professional services agreement between the city of Slida and Workshop Design, LLC. Second. <clears throat> Motion and second. Uh, discussion? Okay. If all this money, we better have a roll call. Alec? Yes. Your key? Yes. Brown? Yes. Baker? Yes. Rogers? Yes. <coughs> this motion is carried. Mr. Mayor, Council, Thanks, thank Dan. you. Thanks, Dan. Okay, Minister. Thank you. Okay, as you know, I've been working for some time to uh, secure a crossing at the end of F Street to access uh, the property across the tracks, um, the growing trail system, County Road 177, uh, all the public lands beyond there. Um, we did submit uh, an application to the railroad uh, for their consideration for this. So the process is we submit the application to the railroad. They take about a month, they say, to review that, get us back any formal comments. Um, and if they are satisfied with the application, then we'll go ahead and submit an application to the Public Utilities Commission, who are the authority to approve uh, crossings. Um, and the railroad would be supportive of that application. And really, that's just. Um, my understanding from the PUC folks is it's just a matter of making, checking that all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted and they'll go ahead um, and approve. That with their approval comes an expectation of construction of the actual crossing. And they generally will put a pretty tight timeline on that, you know, a 30 to 60 day um, limitation depending on the scope of the construction. This one's obviously pretty simple. Our cost estimate for the improvements is about $9,200. Um, this is one instance where I think it would be very viable for the city to potentially um, work with the prison, the paid prison crew on installation since the majority of the cost is going to be in labor, um, not materials. It's installing fence, basically um, putting some road base down, spreading that out, and installing fencing um, on both sides of this crossing and easement and some signs. Um, so we may potentially be able to see that cost come down. This cost estimate is based on um, market. So what's this look like? I don't. I, I, mm -hmm. it, is it just evening up the ground with the track? Is that what it's, it's doing? Basically, putting road base over the tracks, the three sets of tracks there, um, to make that a level crossing. Uh, the easement would be about 20 feet wide, um, so you got that width to cover. And then they would request, they've requested that we fence the entire easement between um, the parking lot at the end of F Street and County Road 177 uh, with openings where the road to Calco goes across. Um, we've proposed that that would be wildlife friendly fencing rather than six foot chain link. And they're considering that. Um, they seem to be favorably considering that. So that saves us both money and I think aesthetics is a lot less like you're in a tunnel going to a jail um, and more pleasing. And they, I did mention previously, I think uh, the PUC would require that we put up the warning signs, um, the cross bucks uh, as well. And so there's some expense in purchasing those signs. Um, although the fence will go across the tracks, uh, the PUC will still require that signage. I'm having a hard time picturing this. So is this parallel to the crossing? Is that what you're saying? Or is it? This would be a, a basically where you walk so there's the caboose and there's the exit, um, the, whole, the gap in the fence that people mm -hmm. use to access the railroad property. So that's where the fence, the corridor would take off and it would head more or less across um, the tracks from there to meet up with the county road um, by Mr. Espinoza's property, next to Mr. Espinoza's property, and then up to the um, trail 
connection there at the bottom of the Duke's Grave Trail, about that area. You said 20 feet wide? 20 feet wide. Okay. That's Just come out of Conservation Trust Fund? I don't know. It sounds like that type of a project. Yeah. I would certainly ask them that question. Seems so reasonable. are people going that are going the uh, parallel with the tracks, are they no. going to be fenced or I, I guess people I'm, who are going parallel with the tracks are trespassing. Well, they've been doing it for years. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think there will be any um, <laughs> the, ga the that area will be fenced with the exception of the Calco Road. The, the, there will be no fence across the Calco Road. So the traffic can still move on that. I say if you can drive that home, congratulations. Yeah. With yes. UP, you bet. Yeah, and Finally. I think and I, I like Keith's idea about looking at Conservation mm -hmm. Trust Fund mm -hmm. too. Sure. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But yes, go for yep. it. Okay, unless there's an um, objection, we'll move ahead um, when we get the all clear to make the PUC application. Mm -hmm. And that was about the only way that people could get to into town and go around that bike route <laughs> when they didn't open up Sackett from going from uh, across town. I wanted to um, bring to your attention, I'm sure you all get the CML um, information, the CML is hosting uh, Cities and Towns Week, October 20th to 26th. Um, they're trying to effort to highlight uh, what municipal governments do. They are providing a number of videos and templates for communities to utilize locally um, to inform residents. And uh, we were planning to participate in that, in putting the videos on Channel 10, uh, make them available from our website, that sort of thing, um, if the council is in favor of our doing that. Do it. <coughs> but no, Michael Varnum is actually featured in one of the videos. Mm -hmm. You'll have to see that one. Um, our memorandum of agreement with the South Arkansas Fire, Depart Fire Protection District is about to expire in mid-November. They would like to enter into discussions about renewal of that agreement. Um, so I'm asking if there are any changes in particular that the City Council would look to achieve in a new agreement or if there's a member of the council who would like to participate in those discussions um, or that they, I think it's, I believe it's Jim Skanga is going to be representing the fire protection district in those discussions. Has uh, Chief Best weighed in on this? Does he have any recommendations for any modifications? We're trying to not put um, the chief in the in the center of things because he does act as chief for both entities. He um, ah. does appreciate the functional relationship that the city and South Arc have had in recent years. It wasn't always that way. It certainly makes his life easier, but he would prefer to leave any negotiation or discussion to the um, respective entities. Would it be possible to ask them to pay for his camera, infrared camera? Um, I think those are the types of things that could be discussed. Um, certainly the amount that the South Arc uh, pays to the city for uh, the partnership. Um, and also they have likely will have some requests as well. Um, I know one of their ongoing concerns is that that fire marshal position has never been refilled um, since it was vacated um, 2002 or so. Um, and that's something that they want to discuss. If there's no one with particular interest in participating, I'll certainly go ahead and have those conversations with Mr. Skanga, and obviously it comes back to you guys for approval. Good. Okay. Yeah, I think I, did, did we all nod? That was a nod. Mm -hmm. yeah. As I believe you all know now, the uh, Slida School District uh, was awarded the District of Distinction designation again. Um, it is, again, a, a great honor, the second year in a row. Uh, my understanding is that this will now be a three-year designation. There won't be um, more um, designees for the next several years. So even more um, sort of 
weighty than the previous year when they achieved this designation. They are planning a community celebration on Friday, October 3rd, highlighting this distinction. I believe that celebration will now include a tailgate party um, in the Kesner parking lot. Uh, Greg Wall from Wallbangers is ge very generously um, taking charge of that and will be providing um, a considerable, considerable discount um, for the community to put eat there in advance. Um, they would like to uh, fire, have fireworks um, after the halftime um, to sort of end halftime and um, our fire department has agreed that they can certainly provide that service. That would be, um, they would be launching them from the middle school property on that evening. And uh, in trying, to, we are participating very actively with the school district in helping to plan the event. Um, we have staff that plans events um, a little bit more often than they do, so trying to help them out with this. And they have, are, of course, looking for funding to help um, offset the expense of the celebration. And we are requesting that the council consider up to $1,000 towards um, offsetting some of the expense, particularly the fireworks that would be launched during the event on October 3rd. What, what do you need from us? Uh, just you need a nods or? I would take a, a vote on um, the a, expenditure a of a, a, a big a nod. A <laughs> uh, big vote. nod that's attached to a motion <laughs> to approve the expenditure of funds. So um, move. Yeah, second. Okay. All in favor? All in favor. Uh, uh, or? Nod. Uh, uh, nod. No. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Kenny, the have also requested that any of the alumni out of that school try to get as many of the alumni there as we can. If you'd be interested in inviting some of your buddies. How many are sitting in here in the audience? <laughs> alumni, maybe oh. Mr. Tafoya. Several of us. Yeah. There you go. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, yeah. There's another one back there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, Jan wanted me to plug her sales tax fundamentals class one more time. That's coming up on Thursday. Uh, I know everyone's excited about that. Uh, but it really is a good opportunity to bring in um, some folks from the Department of Revenue to speak to um, our accounting firms, uh, bookkeepers, and small business owners about the correct way to uh, report sales tax. There are two of those classes offered on Thursday, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, there's information on the flyer on how to sign up for that. I had a couple of more quick announcements. The wastewater treatment plant, once again, has had a completed a year of no accidents. And I asked Randy, I, I think it's some 14, 15 years in a row that they've had no, no accidents at the plant, no workers' comp claims, no, no significant accidents. And it's not the safest place to work, so they do, it, as you know, an excellent job there. So I wanted to recognize that. Uh, Kahan um, had offered to, in the spirit of trying to promote more um, community discussion or community awareness about the city related things, had offered to have a standing weekly half hour um, show. Um, you know, I think it's up for discussion on what that format would be or who would be on it, things like that. But if that is something that the council would like us to pursue, um, we can. And, and bring back a proposal on what that would look like. Uh, we already do. We do a weekly column, for example, for the Mountain Mail. So this would be potentially another avenue uh, for public communication. Should hearing, take them up on that. Hearing no objection, so. we'll um, <coughs> continue to There's pursue that and That's flesh out what that might mean. Nod. It's a short nod. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nod. It was discussed at this morning's Natural Resource Center meeting, um, the request for qualifications for developers for workforce housing. Um, this is something the NRC board has been um, particularly interested in trying to pursue and came out of the public meetings and the priorities for use of the Vanderveer property. Uh, in developing the RFQ um, and talking with the NRC board this morning, really feeling like that should be a joint um, call for proposals between with both the NRC and the City of Salida sort of logos on that, uh, understanding that ultimately the disposition or long-term lease of any property would come before this body uh, for approval. So trying to make that a more inclusive process between both bodies um, and make sure everybody's on the same page as we start to march down this road. 
This proposal specifically is looking at probably around uh, 10 acres um, off of County Road 104, um, trying to target a developer who would pursue um, a, a tax credit project. So hitting at a minimum, including some of that um, 40 to 60 percent area median income, and also certainly open to a combination of um, market rate and um, restricted um, housing um, options, targeting the larger 40 percent to 120 percent AMI for this first project. Um, this project, as well as um, one of the other more industrial park development projects, are both aimed at either of them could stand alone, both of them would result in getting the utilities, um, either of them would result in getting the utilities at least to um, that section of County Road 104, which is certainly a goal that then makes the balance of the property more ripe for development and potentially um, looking at future uses there and additional housing opportunities um, becoming available. What are the budget ramifications for the city? At this time, there wouldn't, we wouldn't um, anticipate any outlay of money from the city in order to facilitate this happening. The development would have to stand on its own, and that's probably where the tax credit um, comes in uh, for this first step. Them being able to, a developer being able to utilize that very advantageous um, financing mechanism. So the use of city staff, like Dan, for example, mm -hmm. I noticed his name and address on that. RFQ. Sure. So would we start accounting for that in, a, in an account uh, mm -hmm. for support for NRC or? Uh, we wouldn't typically. Um, and part of this, again, it's a joint venture with the, the City of Salida and the Natural Resource Center. Having our staff uh, on board from the beginning of planning stages of this type of development certainly helps to facilitate the uh, entitlement phase of the development as well at which point they are obligated to be involved. I'd like a, a, quite a bit more information because I, you know, this is the first we really, you know, there's been little things thrown out here and there, but I, I'd really like to be able to look at what is really involved here and what we're, we'd be uh, making a commitment to because it sounds like the separation is undone again and I I would really like to see what they have in mind for us to be involved I mean we've been kind of left out of the process up to this point yeah, I agree I think I'd kind of like to see maybe a more formal presentation to the City Council and um, before they put the city's name on there that says you know that, that, that seems to me like before you send out something and say the city of Salida is requesting this, that the city council ought to have some say in whether that goes or not? So I, I should back up. Um, what we discussed this morning was um, we took it as a first draft to the NRC board this morning. Um, it is something they've talked about for a while. We'll make some refinements um, and bring that back as a final draft in two weeks. And what we talked about was also bringing the RFQ in before the city council uh, in two weeks from now as well for consideration. Okay. Three, October 7th, the next meeting. I'm sorry, I forgot there's five Tuesdays in September. Well, I, we still don't even have an understanding of a number of things, so I still have a lot of questions. I'm not against it. I just would like to see something that makes some sense as far as our involvement, where we stand, and some basic things that we've been asking for all along and to review what the process is. Maybe, you know, of course I'm not an expert on this, but I, I, I just have a lot of questions. I, I can't just jump right in and say, you know, I, I'd like to see what they've, they've got in mind in a more concrete way. So it might, might help, uh, might be helpful if you could send us, um, you know, some more information, uh, if whatever, additional information or explanation you might have, send it to us so we can be looking at it between now and the next meeting. Yep, I can go ahead and um, email the council the draft that the NRC considered this morning as a starting point. Okay. Um, and certainly let me know what yeah. questions come yeah, to mind. Yeah, that was so done. That, that could generate some back and forth <laughs> questions and so yeah, forth. Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you can generate those questions, then we can be prepared to, to answer them and, and discuss it with the full council um, okay. on October 7th. Okay. 
Um, so a couple of things um, in response to Monica Griesenbeck's comments earlier um, regarding payment for the RV dump. Um, I did um, say that I would confirm that with Jan following the discussions on Friday night. Her um, direction at this time, she was planning to do was, um, it's all paper money, right? Um, transfer, make a general fund transfer to the water sewer enterprise and have the um, uh, water sewer enterprise then um, own that asset going forward. Um, we have one checking account, so it's just how we code it internally. Um, so if that makes sense, that's what the direction is right now. That's how we were planning so, to operate. So the general fund's basically paying for it? General exactly. fund will pay for it. It will be coded to the yeah. water sewer enterprise. The funds will be transferred to that the That was water my sewer. understanding, too, as well as Monica's. Okay. Um, and the statement, another an additional question that Monica raised, um, she stated that Jan was proposing uh, four to five percent increases uh, for the water and sewer and fees. And I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what the percentages were that you said. So I want to be clear that what Jan was presenting was simply the recommendations from the previous rate studies that were done. That's what she was presenting. Um, and my understanding of the direction from the council at the work session last night was to go with uh, cost of living for now. That that's what we're programming into the budget for now, understanding there may be further discussion. It was the 2.9, I believe. Yeah. So 2.9 in water and 2.9 in sewer. Correct. Yep. It's 2.9 for water and 2.9 for sewer. 5.8. Right. We pay for both. Yeah. We use both. <laughs> yep. A 2.9% increase in water, 2.9% in sewer. Uh, I did want to comment. I understand that. Well, yeah. would, is that right? Now, would it no. be if your your water and your sewer bill? I mean, we, I, we just get. I just look at one number. I don't pay. Yeah, I, I didn't understand it as being a compilation. So, of that total number of the combined total, mm -hmm. would it be five point eight percent? Yes. Okay. The math teacher says yes. Okay. So, yeah, so what you said is right. Yes, 2% on each. That's what we agreed on. Um, regarding so. the pay plan um, and the value of our police and fire uh, employees, absolutely. They're uh, invaluable to the organization. Um, and I do want to remind the city council that we have an adopted pay plan. We look organization wide and look at equity amongst the departments and how employees are positions are classified uh, within that pay plan and so we don't look at departments in isolation we look at job duties and responsibilities and drop them into those various positions into the matrix um, which obviously comes to the city council for approval um, so we do try and value all of our employees and um, based on the, the jobs and the responsibilities that they're responsible they are have to fulfill. I'm wondering if we need to look at that a little bit differently if we're having that kind of a discrepancy in, in uh, uh, being able to uh, maintain that particular position when we seem to have employees that are okay with the other. I mean, I would, that's a heavy burden to put on the city every time, you know, when we find these kind of discrepancies. I mean, it's like, we, should we raise everybody's pay because administrators get so much more or whatever I don't I don't get the um, mm -hmm. a reason why we have to not deal with I would certainly note that while we have an officer position that has remained open for some time this is not an isolated incident in the organization within the last year we've had a number of positions that we've had a great deal of difficulty filling um, in a variety of uh, the departments so I do think we have a problem we're trying to be able to come and discuss that um, more objectively mm -hmm. with the city council, bringing um, the comparables both from other municipalities as well as from other employers here in Chaffee County and compiling that information for you to take a look at. Uh, Dara, yep. if you go back one more time to that 5.8 or 2.9, I was assuming that 
you'd take your bill today time the, times the cost of living. Well, the bill today is sewer and water. Mm. And if you take 2.9 times that, then that takes care of the cost of living for both, doesn't it? Okay. You don't take 2.9 and then 2.9. I think it's that's, accounting. Well, it was Later, just... Later, accounting it. That's why I surprised what you, by what you said, because... I'm with Tom. I think the 2.9 on the total was the intent of that. That's the that was yeah, my intent. That's kind of yeah. what I thought. Too. Okay. So sorry about. I'll take that back to Jan. And let her know. If you would. That was my intent. Yeah. Of the total is what you're saying of the total. total. Yeah, we're working on the budget. The total is 2.9. Right. Yeah. Which is what the total. if you did it on separate layer would be. Yeah. Right. If you I wanted the total bill total. times 2.9, 2 not 5. Right. Five point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that you're. I think that when you put 2.9 on one side and 2.9 on the other side, it's 2.9 on the total. Right. That's, that's what that's I get. That's, that's right. That's right. That. It's not. Yeah. That's why I. Let's define the math teacher. I don't. Do Thank that. you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, we'll verify that and uh, do the math. Not my strong suit. I'm more of a calculus sort of girl. Um, so a couple of upcoming things this Friday. We have the employee appreciation, um, barbecue. Uh, the <coughs> course, you're certainly all welcome. I have gotten a couple of RSVPs um, from you, but if you haven't RSVP'd, please do. Um, what time is it? The, well, the teeing off is at 1, I believe, and the dinner is 5.30 or so. 5.30. Um, at the club? Yep, at the golf club. At September 30th, Bring as you all know, we do have the budget work session. I want to make sure everybody has that on their calendar. And then again, the October 9th, we have that CML district meeting in Florence. So you didn't have any problems with the, inter the intergovernmental? No, we all um, sort of had the aha moment that we didn't we just have this meeting. So the county commissioners are proposing that we have that on Wednesday, October 29th. I believe that's the Wednesday, uh, uh, the last Wednesday of October. That would be good. So there shouldn't be a Say the date again. I believe it's Wednesday, October 29th, the, the last that Wednesday. Wednesday. And who's, uh, who's sponsoring this time? The county, county. is hosting this time. Okay. Great. I am available. So our work yeah. session's still on for the 30th. For the 30th. Yes. Uh, I do have the sales tax report, which I'll go ahead and read. Okay, collections of sales tax for the month of July were $495,831, a 3.5% increase from July 2013. Excluding all transactions prior to June, both positive and negative for both, both 2013 and 2014, the year-over-year -year increase was 5.1%. Collections for the first seven months of 2014 total. 2.5 million, which is an increase of nearly 123,000, or 5.1 percent compared to the same period in 2013. Compared to the previous year, the 2014 sales tax collected by businesses engaged in retail trade, which compromises approximately two-thirds of Salida's total sales tax, increased 5.8 percent year-to-date. The next largest industry group is restaurants, with approximately 14 to 15 percent of the total. And this group of businesses increased 3.1% so far this year. July figures indicate a drop in collections. However, this is due to a large amount of delinquent payments processed in July 2013. Um, sales tax collected by hotels, motels, and vacation rentals increased 9.7% so far this year, led by very strong collections for March and in spite of a dip in January that was due to delinquent collections received in January of the previous year. As a percentage of total collections, the lodging industry only accounts for about 5%. However, this group is also an indicator for the level of tourism that brings spending in other sectors as well. Salida's share of the Chaffee County tax for July was 159000 and change, an increase of over $7,000 or 4.8%. For the first seven months of 2014, Salida's share of the Chaffee County tax totaled $813,214, an increase of nearly 42000 or 5.4%. Can you send a copy of that to us? I will do that now. Thank you. And that's all I have for this evening. <laughs> okay. I don't have nearly that much. 
Um, just a couple of quick things. Um, it has been a long time since we've had a land use hearing in front of City Council, and Crestone Mesa is coming up for its public hearing on October 21st. Uh, I know that it's been a while, almost a year since um, everybody went through kind of a refresher course or a new course in quasi-judicial hearings uh, and your roles and responsibilities in that. And I know that you're going to be getting a lot of comments from the public leading up to that, um, people wanting to provide you input prior to that hearing. And I just wanted to kind of remind the council that that is a different style of hearing than what you normally have in this chamber in that it is quasi-judicial. You're sitting in the role of a judge. Um, and making determinations, specific determinations on somebody's property rights. That being the case, you're required to make your decision on the information that is presented to you at the public hearing. And so one of the things you're going to run into, I know a lot, is people coming up to you and saying, hey, I'm for this, I'm against this, and I'm sure you guys are saying, that's great, but I need you to come to the public hearing and testify because that's the only way to get the information in. And they're saying, well, I really don't want to do that, it's time consuming, whatever. Um, unfortunately, they really do need to come in or they need to provide written comments uh, and have those submitted for the packet because it's really important in these land use hearings that you, you're making your decision on the information that's presented to you at that hearing. It'll include minutes from the Planning Commission. It'll include the recommendation from the Planning Commission. But that's really, um, it's really like being in a court. And, and so from both the applicants and the public side, you sitting in that role as the decision maker you know, if you were in court, you wouldn't want the judge talking to one of the attorneys out in the hallway and making their decision on something that you weren't a part of. And so I just kind of wanted to kind of give everybody a refresher on that because I know you're going to be hearing about it because it's, it's – um, and it's a piece of property that just has a tendency to have um, – there's a lot of passion around it. And so I'm, I'm sure you're going to hear this. And so just be prepared for it. And uh, like I said, you just got to get them to either submit written comments or, or bring it in. Um, bring their testimony in live and, and provide it as part of the of is there a the statute that goes with that because I'm still when it, you're you're if you're going to any of the land use hearings or the planning hearings beforehand and as open meetings are you saying we cannot go to those meetings that are open public meetings I'm saying that it's not a best practices for you to be doing that because in the event that the, uh, and I'll give you by way of example, um, you have a land use, a controversial land use decision and it is decided on a 4-3 and you happen to be the vote that is one of those four that um, approves or denies that project. And during the course of that hearing you said, you know, I was at the planning commission hearing and somebody mentioned this, that or the other and that's why I'm making my decision. At that point, one side or the other has the right to challenge the validity of the process because you made your decision based not on information you received at the hearing upon which you were required to make that decision, but you're basing your decision on information you got outside of the scope of that hearing. That's really the risk is that it puts the land use decision um, potentially at risk, the process at risk. and so. The reality is you're going to get all of that information in front of you as a council when it comes to that public hearing on that matter in front of council. And so that's why I'm saying I can't tell you not to go. I'm telling you not, it's not a best practices and I'm telling you that in a, in a tight split vote, it opens the door to challenge the process. Now the outcome of that is uh, if you lose on that, as if, you know, we're defending the process that we went through, if you lose on that, you, you know, typically you have to go back and do it over again. Um, normally the court won't substitute its judgment for that of the, the counsel. So I'm not going to tell you you absolutely can't. I'm telling you that it's not a best practices on a land use hearing to do that as, uh, as kind of either the appellate body or as the final decision maker because um, in, say, the example of Creststone, I don't want to get into specifics, obviously, for that same reason, but Planning con uh, Commission is making a recommendation to this body for a final decision. Um, you, you want to take that evidence that's in front of you at the time, um, at the time of that hearing, that public hearing that, that they're holding. So that's that, really it. I tell you what would be helpful to me if, um, if, if I knew, because I've already asked Dara for some documents, for some background information mm -hmm. that I feel like I need to familiarize myself with, but I don't know 
Uh, are, are any of those, like I asked for the, well, obviously for an up-to-date copy of the comprehensive plan, uh, the, uh, uh, the strategic housing plan, um, what was the, I mean, I can't remember. There were about four documents packet I asked for. Yeah. Planning yeah. commission, packet, planning commission, uh, minutes. Is, is there anything? So here's what I would say. I guess what I'm asking you is, is what all do I need to, right. to be familiar You're with? with. And in, in here's, here's what I would suggest. All of the citywide planning documents, absolutely I would sit down and, and take a look at and read through get familiar with because you're going to be asked to be making decisions. Um, people are going to be arguing points in those documents. Uh, also, frankly, the municipal code to the, to the extent um, that it is a major subdivision or I can't remember even which categories it falls into. You'll be getting a full packet um, with the council packet with all of that information from like the planning commission minutes and all of those kinds of things. And honestly, I'd prefer to see those all go out to council at the same time. Uh, it may be that that portion, since it's a large, it's a, a new land use hearing and we've had some time, it may be that that could go out mm -hmm. early mm -hmm. to you guys all um, it, it com in co a complete form, and I think that would yeah. be helpful to you guys. The earlier the better. The earlier the better, but absolutely sit down and take a look at those citywide planning documents ahead of time, and if you don't have copies, um, I thought copies were provided. And they're all on, on our website as well. As and well. I know uh, and I, I know it's we've yeah. talked it, about. I have a problem. I don't know why it is when I when and, I and click like I on said, a link on the website. Those I, readily, readily you know, readily available pages. documents is not an issue. Yeah, absolutely. And and I would encourage you frankly cuz I my hope is is that you're going to see a lot more land use going on in town. So, mm -hmm. do we uh, does do the county zoning um, and land use uh, have been, since this property abuts against a county residential area, does that have any relevance for our decision? No. Um, it, it really doesn't. And, and I, I'm not going to talk about this specific application, but there, they would probably was sent out on referral to the county? Yep. Um, so you will, see, you will see comments to the extent the county has any. You'll see comments in the packet um, as far as part of that application process. So that, that's kind of where it comes up. But as far as jurisdictional control, no. Under, under that 4-3 scenario that you went through, just went through, is there a possibility for lawsuit against the city or against individuals? Um, it, it would probably be against the city. It would just be a challenge. It's a, it would be a one, what we call a 106 action. It's challenging um, the process. And that's why I'm saying is that I just, it is, um, it's just a best practices kind of thing to, you know, you to, have, to, yeah, to have that, that to have that line readily available of hey I'd love to hear your views on this but for me to take them into consideration I need you to come to the hearing or I need you to put them in writing yep. it's kind of the same thing on not you know not trying to pre-educate yourself or educate yourself outside the boundaries of that it, it's a very linear process and like I said you really need to think about it in terms of how would you want to be treated um, if you were walking into the courtroom um, in terms of the information that the judge or the jury got before you walked into the courtroom. Um, you, you don't want them to prejudge it or have information that you don't have the opportunity to know what it is and respond to it. And, that, and that's really what it's about. A, a, it's about just kind of a fundamental fairness issue on everybody being on, the, on a level playing field with the information being presented. And I would add, um, if you do receive emails or things like that, if you forward them to Dan, he can certainly include them in the packet so that everybody has the same information in front of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, I guess, my suggestion in the day of, of multimedia is, you know, it, you're going to want to respond to the constituent. I would suggest you respond by saying, thank you for your comments. I'm forwarding this on to, to be included in the packet um, as, as part of the information at the hearing. Because okay. certainly we want to get all that information in and, and we want it to be considered. Um, so that's kind of the way to get it there. Um, the, just a quick update on... You have two cases that are up on appeal right now, um, the, uh, what we'll call the Oxier land use case, um, which is now fully briefed in front of the Court of Appeals. Um, I have no timeline on when they might render a decision or if they're going to request oral arguments. If they do, it'll be in probably the first quarter of next year. Um, so I'll keep you updated um, if that transpires. Uh, the other one is the, uh, the budget case um, that Steve Dawes from the, uh, is handling and that is just beginning its briefing schedule, so pr presumably it'll be fully briefed in about 60 days um, between opening brief, reply, and response. Um, so those two are ongoing. 
there's also uh, a week ago Friday, um, Councillors Brown and Hallett uh, delivered a, a privileged and confidential letter to me um, and CC Council on that on a variety of issues. I know you guys have been really busy with the budget and a lot of other things. I'm asking that you take a look at that and provide me some direction at the October 7th meeting on, on what you want to do with that, um, if anything, or where you want, how you, you know. Um, I just would like to get some direction. Uh, so, like I said, I know you guys have had a ton of meetings and a, and a budget workshop. So if you could be prepared to give me some direction at the next meeting, I'd sure appreciate it. And that's all I had this evening. Thank you. I've got a question for you. And you folks can shoot me down. We, I think, awarded three uh, retail licenses at the last meeting or two meetings ago. Well, we passed an ordinance pot. authorizing them. Yeah. Yeah. And since then, one has been found to be 942 uh, feet. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm going to stop you for two reasons. <laughs> One is, is this is one of those things that will come in front of council, um, and so I'd rather address those as in fairness to that applicant at that time. Um, so well, I, I want to know if this council has the right to say 58 feet. We're not, um, we're not going to mess with it. Yeah, I'd like to. I don't want to resurrect the problem if if we're going to. If well, it, it's um, and, and Dara has to enforce, right? Understand, and, and, and I, I understand that that there's a September 24th sort of deadline. If if we don't give direction, well, then she she has an obligation to tell them no license. Um, well, the the problem I have is that the the issue is not in front of the council under your code. I I would love to be able to say yeah, just give me direction and we're all good, but I can't, the, the, the process, there again, that process is not there. Do I think that you have the ability to look at the facts and make a determination as to if that is an appropriate distance? Yes, I think you have that discretion. Do I think you can do it now without the benefit of the application being in front of you? No, I don't. Did that so, make sense? So under new business, do we put it on next, um, next, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that. I mean, this this individual's losing money every day. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think we can. I think it'll likely be on your October seventh agenda for you and, to make and, that and determination. And you're not going to yank her September twenty fourth. It's not. There's going to be no impact on the on the business. medical marijuana dispensary license. It has zero impact on that. And there's a specific statutory provision that addresses this specific issue because of the statutory changes that occurred over time uh, with the MMD. So that's fine. She's not going to, there's no loss of license, even if that's in question underneath the MMD state statute. It's as to the new retail license. You all are going to need to make that determination at a hearing on it on October 7th. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sure. Now I'm done. <laughs> He's done. Oh, um, okay, done. yeah, I'm sorry. Did you hand that out? No. You, you don't I didn't you take the bring the cop. You, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Email that. Laurel and Hardy. I think I'm the straight guy. I'm not sure. Um, did get a letter back from Ken Guckenberger. Uh, not as detailed as I would have hoped. This is on the 6320, um, whether or not to keep it or not. Um, he's comfortable with um, having it go away. Uh, provided um, a few points of guidance on how to make that happen. Um, I think at this point that probably, um, I think it's going to loop back around. I think the NRC discussed it this morning um, and may take action on it um, at their next meeting and then bring it forward to council as a formal recommendation. Um, the bottom line is it's doable. Um, at this point there's no real consequences to doing that. Um, you know, I think we've discussed the pros and cons a couple of different times on flexibility versus um, the ability to issue tax exempt financing. Um, well, some of the members did seem to be in question as to whether they felt it was they were comfortable with the the comments that came back. Uh, I think they wanted something a little more definitive than that. Well, we, yeah, boiled, and, and it, we <laughs> boiled it down to one question basically was whether we can, can flip flop from 
Yeah, out um, and, 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 and here's where bond Thank council you. is even um, more conservative than I am. Nobody has ever done that before. They don't have any precedents to say yes, you can or no, you can't. That's can. why he didn't answer. So he, did, <laughs> so I didn't get an answer on it because there's no, there's real no. Here's what I will tell you though: is that from my standpoint, and I was, la I was, we actually, I met with Michael Scott today, and I said, you know, when I put on my conservative uh, municipal, slay, you know, hat, or my, you know, when I'm working with bond council, and I would say there's no precedent that says that you can do this, so you can't. Then I put on my developer attorney's hat. And they say, there's no precedence that says I can't do this. Um, so I, I think it's an open question. What I would say, though, is that I think there are a variety of ways that you could achieve that financing status on a portion of the property if you had a project that really warranted it. Um, and, and I think there are a couple of different ways to do that and, and ways that might, frankly, be more, um, more effective at this point. I don't know. So I, I'm not too concerned personally from a develop, and there again, I'm going to put on my developer attorney hat, I'm not too concerned that I couldn't structure a deal um, if I needed to do a tax exempt financing out there that we couldn't find a way to make that happen even if you have stepped away from the 6320 status. Okay. Would you gotcha. send us that letter? Yeah, and I'm sorry, I meant to run a cop. I, sure. That's what I said, but said, yeah. no, I, anyway. My apologies. And, and was, uh, basically said there were no tax implications. Right. There's no tax implications because there hasn't been a financing and that was issued with tax exempt. <laughs> so. For sure. Right. Yeah. No, I, I would have liked more too, honestly, but that's. Yeah, that was a very vague letter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, we're hope, hoping that one paragraph isn't real expensive. Uh, I don't think it is. Um, yeah. I, I'm not even sure Ken is going to charge you, um, <laughs> but that's kind of... We're splitting the zero. You could with probably the city, though, be convinced to waive the fee. If right. I, I mean, I don't think, I, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it definitely, if you hit the uh, two and a half pages from bond council, it gets a little expensive, but I think that one, we'll see. But I, I don't think it's very expensive. Okay, now I'm done. You're done. I think. You're on. I do not have anything for tonight. Okay, oh, Betty. You do. Good. Okay. Let's have it. As the city council is already aware, our position in regard to the two way sales tax was submitted by Rodney Carney and Betty Carlisle, the proponents, on August 29, 2014, for approval of tax reform. The proponents have previously submitted a petition that was not approved as reform, but the new petition contained changes and was subjected to the same approval process. The petition is to modify how the two-way city sales tax funds are allocated. The petition was approved as reform on September 5, 2014, and the proponents were notified of such approval. The petition will require at least 209 valid signatures to be declared. Is there a, a, a time limit on getting those signatures and turning it back in? Uh, 180 days. 180 days from what was the date again? Sep September 5th? Rick, who's next? Not me. I'm okay. Uh, I'm not here. Okay, I don't have any. I want to send, share something that the public has been sharing with me. Um, I think, I'm sure many of you have seen the painted um, re restrictions of miles per hour on our streets. And what I'm hearing from the public and I'm noticing myself is I read those more often than I read street signs. In fact, the street signs are behind branches and sometimes behind other signs and all of it. I'm wondering if we ought to consider having more of those painted on our streets. And I was thinking even, you know, if we can ever get the trucks running in the right streets to put no trucks allowed painted <laughs> just as they come off of Highway 50 uh, to start, try to get people to be more aware of uh, what our, uh, our laws are. 
Uh, I want to follow up a little bit on something I talked to you guys at the budget meeting about this uh, combine. Uh, I contacted this Estes Banks, who is a member of the NFL, and he responded back to me and said that he would be available to come and talk at our next, not the next council meeting, there. When's the second council meeting in October? October 21st. I think it's 21st. <coughs> he said he would be available to come and talk to the council. And I think it's better that he talks to the council in this venue for more people to hear it than to be in the budget meeting. Mm -hmm. And he said he would do a presentation. I'll get more details on it if we can get him scheduled on uh, uh, October 21st. Melody. I think, is it specifically in, in regards to request for funding or um, no, just no, about the No, not really. Idea? He's not. Uh, that was my, that was me. Okay. Uh, it's basically to outline the, pro the program and to bring everybody up to speed. He has had meetings with, several meetings with the uh, school board and uh, I think it's going to take a countywide effort so I would hope by him coming and and presenting the program to us that maybe the county would then get interested in the Buena Vista town would get interested in I think the Buena Vista school may have already been contacted so anyway it'll be just a presentation to tell you more in detail what I tried to tell you the other day, and probably a whole lot more accurate. I can certainly put them on for a presentation on the 21st. Sounds fine. A nod. I wanted to speak on uh, last night's uh, disdain that was conveyed by some of the council members and staff because I wanted. I want them to understand how did nothing coming close to breaking the sunshine law with his town hall meeting Friday night and and I and he was I'm, he certainly wasn't meant to raise the ire of staff and and that it didn't really justify their actions because all he was trying to do was meet with his public and get their input on the budget process that meeting didn't even, as far as I understand, doesn't, didn't even have to be noticed because the council members that were present were just attending a presentation by Hal and were not conducting any city business or giving any direction. Um, I, I hope that the staff would be familiar with the statutes pertaining to the Sunshine Law so that they don't get uh, upset when Hal does another meeting. Because uh, they're, again, his, He's just trying to get these people, the public, up to up to speed with what is going on with the budget profit process in an in a informal atmosphere, and and if the administrator, the public work director, did not want to field questions, all they had to do was turn it back to Hal. I don't think he would have been offended that you didn't feel comfortable answering those questions. I'm sure you weren't prepared, and we can understand that. Um, you just have uh, the minority of the council was removed from the agenda process and are left with little to do but go to the court of public opinion. And in a sense, we've been silenced by the voting process and ca council meetings. So there's an irony here because these the reactions by the council and the staff made it appear that they were disrespected. And, and I think they've lost sight of the fact that the other half of council feels subjected to being left out in the process on a continual basis. We don't have the vote, and they do. So nothing at, um, is, it, it's a public's call, and all we're trying to do is get the information out to the public. And it's up to them to take the information and decide for themselves. So we're just trying to put a forum, forum out there so that they have that opportunity. And if it means they're inundated with it, they'll either not show up or they will, you know, they will let us know. So if the public is shut out, I can assure you it has been in the past, but there's no such thing as partial transparency. We're just trying to do our job so that they are in the process. 
wasn't done here unless you guys are going into executive session. Yeah. You got something else? If you are, I'm out of here. <clears throat> okay. We're going to adjourn to uh, uh, executive. needs to make a motion, motion to do that. My question, are, if we're just, uh, why do we need to do that in an executive session? And are we, I mean, this looks like it's a yay or nay thing. Mm, not necessarily. It's actually a negotiation, and that's what I want to ask you guys about. That's why it's an executive session material. If, if I just needed a yay or nay, um, then yeah, I would just put it on the agenda as part of the annexation agreement that will be coming up. But I need a little bit more input potentially from you than that. I move we go into executive session for the purpose of determining positions relative to the matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategies for negotiations, and instructing negotiations. And there is the CRS section 24-6-4024E. And the following additional details are provided for identification purposes, Miramonte Annexation Agreement and Crestone Mesa RETA. I'll second. Okay. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Second. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.